Good afternoon, members and officers. Uh, welcome to February's meeting of the planning committee. Uh, I'm just going to ask Maura here to read out the uh, notice. Thank you. And take the roll. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Members are hereby summoned to attend the monthly meeting of the planning committee being held remotely today on Wednesday, the 2nd of February. Alderman Alan Breslin. Here, Maria. Alan Breslin. Here. I'll come back. I see Alan on the call, but I'm not hearing him. Laura, yeah. Alan is answering yeah. If you can hear him all right, I can hear him all right. I'm just wondering if you can't hear him, Maura. Yes, Keith, I've just confirmed it with Maura. Thanks. Thanks. Alderman Derek. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thanks. Well, thanks, my thank fault. Alderman Derek Hussey. Councillor Hussey. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Here, Mara. Thanks, Keith. Alderman Hilary McClintock. Here, Mara. Thanks, Hilary. Councillor Jason Barr. Jason's running late, Mara. Please both us in about half an hour. Thanks, John. Councillor John Boyle. That's me. Councillor Angela Dobbins. I'll come back. Councillor Paul Gallagher. And Shaw. Maura. Thanks, Paul. Councillor Christopher Jackson. Shaw, Maura. Thank you, Chris. Councillor Dan Kelly. Shaw, Maura. Thanks, Dan. Councillor Patricia Logue. Sure. Thanks, Patricia. Councillor Kier Maguire. Apologies, Maura. Okay, thanks. And Councillor Philip McKinney. Maura. And Councillor Sean Mooney. Here, Maura. Thanks, Sean. I'll just go back, double check. Uh, Alderman Derek Hussey. No, so no call back, and we'll wait. And I'll add Councillor Jason Barr when he arrives. And Angela's just come in there, Angela Dobbins. Oh, thanks, Councillor Angela Dobbins. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Thank you. Right, thanks, Chair. That's the call. Okay, I'd like to remind everyone who is remote attendance that this is a meeting will be broadcast live via the Council's YouTube channel and will be available for viewing by the public and the media. The broadcast will also be available for repeat viewing at a later date. This broadcast may be terminated or suspended in accordance with the Council protocol. Members and approved speakers are reminded to only have their mics and cameras on while speaking at the meeting and to use the chat facility to highlight a request to speak. By participating in this meeting, you're consenting to being filmed and to the use of storage of those images for broadcasting or training purposes and for the purpose of keeping historical records and making those records available to the public. A copy of the Council Privacy Notice may be found on the Council website www.derrystraban.com. Thank you. Uh, do we have any declarations of members' interests? Okay, I don't hear anything, see nothing in the chat box. Okay, going on to Chair's business and Maura has a few items she'd like to uh, bring up. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Members, um, firstly, I'd just like to advise, um, we've had a request for predetermination hearing um, last year and um, an adjoining site um, we also discussed at the time that um, officers had requested that that would potentially um, be dealt with by a predetermination hearing and members accepted that. That was about March time last year and that was for planning application LA 11 2020 03180 and LA 11 2020 02520 and there were sites in um, the Ballamagrote area of Derry. Um, it's been brought to my attention that the agents of both these planning applications have requested that we do not have a predetermination hearing now 
and to proceed to make a decision at committee. Um, as members made this decision, it's important that I come back and um, update you on that matter. Um, and I suppose from my perspective, um, having given you advice previously in regards to the complex nature of the applications and the issues and the controversial nature of potentially the applications uh, in terms of objections, um, I would still be of the view, members, that um, a predetermination hearing would be constructive and helpful for the committee, but it is really a matter for the committee to decide whether or not they still wish to proceed with the PDHs or to withdraw that end of the process and go straight and ask officers to make um, a recommendation in the committee. Um, I'll leave it with you, Chair, um, regarding managing that discussion. But um, as I say, I've given you my um, professional recommendation and that the fact that the PDH um, has already been organised and should be in the diary um, for, I think it's the 9th, 9th of February. Thanks, Chair. Um, that's right. Councillor Dobbins, you wish to come in and speak on the matter? I'll just, uh, I'll just put it on the chat there, Chair. Um, I would actually agree with more there. With regard to the BD, PDH, um, like it is only a week away. So, um, to me, in time difference, it's not going to make any difference. So, and I, I do believe that it may be um, beneficial for us as committee members. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Councillor Dobbins. Councillor Boyle. Thanks, Chair. I'd be of the same view as uh, Councillor Dobbins. Um, um, I know the applications. Um, don't know them in any. Don't know them in huge detail, but I know what they are, uh, and uh, I know by looking at them that they are quite complicated. And I think this committee would probably benefit from um, um, uh, an initial look uh, at it um, and to hear from uh, applicant and agents, etc. So I, I would share that view just uh, for your for your benefit, and probably as much for Maura's benefit as well, Chair. It's not physically in my diary unless there's been an invite sent out that I've missed. Um, but uh, that's not a problem. I can make it, but it's, it's just one of those ones that um, if, if, it, if the invite hasn't gone out, perhaps it needs to go out for the, for the, well, the WebEx end of things. Um, but certainly I would share the same views, Councillor Dobbins. These are complicated matters and a PDH would be helpful. Uh, well, members, I actually don't see anything in the chat box. Uh, um, with uh, opposite views to what has just been expressed. Uh, so I'm going to take it at red that we're going to go with the PhD, which is penciled in for the 9th of February. Has anybody else wished to comment on this before we uh, confirm it? Okay, members will take it as red that the PhD will go ahead on the 9th of February. Kelly? No, Chair, just indicating that I was content with that uh, approach. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Chair, can I just advise that Lois is now going to send out the invite in regards to that? I think it may have gone just simply in an email previously, but she's clarifying that and sending out an invite. Thank you. Or if you wish to move on to your next item, please. Yes, thank chair, you, chair. Chair John, well, chair John Boyle, just uh, again, just briefly, more sorry for interrupting. Would that be a two p.m. start, Maura, because there's an environment and there's generation committee meeting at four o'clock on the same day, which a, a number of us would be sitting. A.M. Yeah, it's a.m. John. Yeah. A.m. An a.m. Okay. Yes, John. Yeah. Thanks. It's nine thirty to twelve thirty a.m. Thank you. Okay, Mark. Okay, Chair, just I want members to be made aware of um, two pieces of important uh, reports that have come out um, in regard to planning in the last um, few days. Um, the Northern Ireland Audit Report in the, on the planning system and since the, the transfer of the, the planning powers into local government, that has been um, published um, on the, sec the 1st of February and also um, the review of legislation, which was done by DFI, which you will recall 
we had the opportunity to engage um, with the department on and had completed a consultation response in regards to that. Um, that came out um, from the department on Friday. So it missed the deadline, obviously, for the papers for this committee, but Chair proposed to um, bring a, a formal paper on both those issues um, into the next committee um, for discussion with members, if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mara. Any comments from the committee on that? Go ahead, John. Thanks, Chair. Um, <clears throat> pardon me, got a bit of a frog in my throat here. Uh, yeah, Chair, thanks. Um, and thanks, thanks for sending those out this morning. Um, I had uh, seen the audit report um, and got a, a fair opportunity to read through it uh, in advance of uh, today's meeting. Um, however, uh, I've really only been had the opportunity to scan um, the department's uh, report that uh, was sent out this morning as well. Chair, I, I think I'm going to make a suggestion. I'm just I'm, I'm open to ideas around it again. Um, uh, I, I, it might perhaps be useful if if we as a planning committee had a a working group or or, or, or some form of a discussion in relation to the two papers, um, uh, and and not necessarily uh, for us to discuss at um, a future planning committee. There's a lot of content on the reports. Um, most of it I didn't find particularly surprising, um, but I I feel it would be much more useful. Um, uh, an, an environment which was dedicated to the two reports, <clears throat> perhaps with a view to our, our, our own uh, planning department and, and, and consultation with ourselves, uh, reviewing um, the, the practices and policies that we currently use, bearing in mind the two reports that, that, that are, would be in front of us. Um, so I'm putting that out there, uh, Chair, to see what others think. Uh, I, I'm making that a proposal, I suppose, really, because I think that would be the most useful way of working our way through this. Um, whereas, if you bring um, matters of, of of this nature and into a, a committee, uh, which already has a significant agenda, then I, I do feel that it doesn't get the attention that perhaps it, it, it deserves at this point. As I said, not an awful lot of it I found surprising, but I think there are definitely things for us to discuss going forward. Uh, as, as a council and as a, a council planning uh, a department and committee, so that is a proposal. We we put that on the workshop as opposed to discuss it on as an item of an agenda. Uh, thanks very much, Councillor Boyle. Just before opening it up to the floor there to discuss that matter, I believe Councillor Lou wishes to come in there. Yes, uh, Chair, and it was on that matter too uh, regarding the the reports. Um, Basically, I have just scanned over them. I haven't read them in any uh, any detail, to be honest with you. Um, but um, I do think uh, they are something that, that we really need to be looking at. And I do agree with, with John that I, I don't think bringing them into um, an ordinary planning meeting would uh, do it justice. So I would suggest that we have maybe um, um, I don't know whether we should have a workshop, but certainly a planning meeting solely uh, for these uh, two reports. And if you'll allow me, Chair, just to um, um, say that I found the MAG um, presentation. I don't know if it was yesterday or the day before. I think it was yesterday. Uh, very useful. So thank you. For those words, Patricia, um, and I'm sure the members here will pass, or sorry, the officers here will pass on their comments on to the, the MAG. Thank you for that. Uh, Hilary, you wish to come in? Alderman McClintock. Thanks, Chair. I would agree with the previous two speakers. I think there's a substantial amount of information in those reports, and like the others, I scan them, um, obviously picking up really on the things that we could have would have identified straight away ourselves. But I think rather than bringing them into a normal planning meeting, that we should have some sort of a um, probably up to the planners what way it would work best, workshop or special uh, planning meeting, whatever way, and some format that we can delve deeper into them and maybe have um, be able to discuss things that are particularly relevant to our own planning committee. So I agree with the other two speakers. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak on the matter? Okay, John, are you proposing that we have a, a working group? Uh, 
do we have a, a seconder? Chair, could you just maybe clarify, are we talking about a working group? Um, I suppose maybe just a sit down around the table type meeting, or are we talking about a, a, a sort of like a sitting in the chamber special planning committee? Yeah, um, I think taking advice here from the team here to talk about a workshop would be more appropriate. Chair, if I could just come on, that's what, <clears throat> that's what I was suggesting. I think that would be more fruitful. Um, uh, and then if, if people feel then that there are elements of that workshop that would require further presentation to the planning committee, um, then well, by all means, and I think that if people feel that appropriate, that's the way we proceed. Um, but I think in the first instance, um, we would probably all want to work our way through it. Um, <clears throat> the other thing as well is, Chair, I, I, I probably did sound like it's probably did sound like I was suggesting you know that it would only be members of the planning committee coming to that workshop. I think it'll be a workshop that every elected member should be able to feed into and respond to. Um, um, <clears throat> so the proposal is for a workshop involving all all planning committee members and any other interested uh, elected representatives who may want to attend. Any more comments on it? All right, on the uh, the floor there. Any members wish to comment? Go yeah. ahead. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with that approach. I think a, a workshop uh, sitting around the table would be very useful and probably more effective uh, and get us quicker to where we need to be uh, than sitting formally down at a special council meeting. So I don't disagree with Councillor Boyce's proposal at all. So happy to, to second uh, that proposal. But I would ask just for the, the um, terms of the public record, I think we have you know, we have the audit office report now as being published. And I think in terms of just maybe uh, completing the set, the circle on that, I think it will be important uh, as the head of planning uh, indicated previously that um, a formal response to that would be laid before the committee. And I think that would be very important, particularly from a council's reputational point of view, uh, that there there is some sort of response on the record uh, addressing some of those issues and concerns. Uh, I mean, it may be beefed out um, in terms of what is discussed at the, the workshop, but I do think at some point a, a report should be uh, placed on the record uh, formally at a, a planning committee. And I think everybody would agree with those comments. I'm just going to, Maura, do you want to comment on any of that? Are you happy enough for we have to go ahead? Yeah. No, I think that makes sense, um, Chair, and I think that's useful discussion and we will take forward. We'll get a date for a workshop and with a view of having a discussion and pulling together some sort of a draft response and bringing that in formally then when members are ready. No problem. OK. OK, members. Um, Sean, I see you're happy with the approach as well. If we have no one who's um, disagreeing with the proposal, uh, we'll take it as unanimous then. That's unanimous. Thank you. Right. Marie, no more. She finished, I think. Okay. Matters arising from open minutes of the planning committee held on Wednesday, the 5th of January. Have any matters arising, members? Chair, could I come in under matters arising? Of course you can, Councillor Kelly, yeah. Thanks, Chair. I'm going to come in under um, P10, 22 and page 3. Uh, it's not directly related to that, so I would appreciate a wee bit of latitude, but it is on, on statutory consultations uh, and statutory consultee responses. I have raised at Council meeting in November uh, of last year in relation to issues around uh, DFI roads, statutory consultation responses to Council. Uh, and it was assured uh, at that meeting by the mayor that a report would come to the planning committee by officers. I was a bit concerned, I suppose, when I came to the other side of Christmas and there was still no indication of anything coming back. So I did write to the director um, of environment and regeneration on the 14th of January and again raised this issue. Uh, and I'm, I'm disappointed that the matter of the, the DFI roads consultation responses is still not um, before members. So I'm just, um, I'm, I'm just raising a chair, hoping that uh, we could get uh, some indication of at least that work is undergoing or has been undertaken uh, and that a report will be filed in due course.
just bear with a second there, um, Councillor Councillor Kelly. Eamon's going to come in here, Don. Thanks, Chair. Uh, uh, we pass away for the report. Chair, I can't hear. I can't hear anything. Well, can you hear me not? Yeah, yeah sorry. sorry. Apologies, apologies, members. And uh, just uh, to Councillor Kelly, Councillor, yes, some work is. Not Can't right. hear him. Those members have technical problem here. For one second. I thank you. Can they, can you hear me? Sorry, members, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Apologies, members. Um, um, and just, just in response to Councillor Kelly Spearey, Councillor, yes, I'm aware that some of work is on the Chair, that's even matters. worse. Chair, that's Chair. worse. Chair, if you're in the same room, you need to turn off your microphone because we're getting feedback. Sorry, members. Are we okay now? Yeah. All good, Emma, there, yeah. Apologies, members. Um, sorry, in response to Councillor Kelly's query, I'm aware that some work um, is being undertaken on that matter, and a report will come. Thank you, Chair. My apologies for having the mic on, members. Uh, okay, uh, any other matters arising? And are you happy with that answer, uh, Councillor Kelly? Chair, can I come on? Sorry. Just given the time frame that's passed, Chair, I wonder is there any indication of when that report is likely to come before members? Uh, again, to, to you, Chair. Yes, we'll endeavour to have that to the next uh, plan. You, Chair. Councillor Dobbins, go ahead. Please. Sorry about that, Chair. I um, no, didn't realise uh, Councillor Kelly was still speaking. Chair, um, Eamon effectively said one sentence i was wondering can you repeat it because i did I only can't caught the last word that's what thomas what basically Amos said is that he will bring a report to the committee uh, at the next meeting thank you chair okay there's no other matters arising we'll now move on to the planning applications and the List for recommended um, decisions. Okay, and the first one we're going to deal with is uh, LA one one two zero two one zero five three three F, and Malik's going to take us through that. And the speaker is Mr. Peter McCafferty, the agent. Malik. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Um, item one is LA 11 2021 0533 F. Um, it's a full application for a change of use from a dwelling to a four bed HMO house of multiple occupancy at 16 Governor Road. And the recommendation is to approve. Um, set before you here is the site location map. Um, the, the site is located at uh, 16 Governor Road which is a predominantly residential area um, off the Strand Road. Um, it's within the development limits of Derry and is located within the central area as defined in the Derry Area Plan 2011. Um, it's a, a mid-terraced um, two-storey uh, dwelling, um, you know, with traditional red brick finishes uh, and black slate roof. Uh, the site is, uh, has got a, a currently has an enclosed rear yard uh, and the rear boundary is defined by a two metre high wall. Uh, the, the photographs here will show, give, show you the context of the site in terms of the, the, the residential layout and character. Um, fairly traditional uh, terrace dwellings uh, on both sides of uh, the street um, with on street parking uh, provided uh, outside the footpaths of each uh, dwelling. 
uh, and these images will show you the, the, the context of the, of the existing dwelling uh, in terms of the front elevation and views of the, the, the rear yard and current rear return uh, as viewed from the, the Muse Lane behind Governor Road. Um, here before us, we have the, the elevations and, and floor plans. Um, that's, that's a change you used to HMO and, and Reality, there's not much in terms of in terms of uh, physical change uh, from what is uh, existing in terms of the residential dwelling. So the policy context, um, we have the RDS, we have the dairy area plan. Uh, there's current policies relating to urban design. It's within the central area. Uh, then we have some of the supplementary policies relating to the environment and water uh, and design layout and car park and provision. We also have PPS free um, access, movement uh, and parking. We have uh, supplementary planning guidance uh, relating to housing and existing urban areas. And we'll start listed here before you. The, the, the relevant policy here is also the strategic planning policy statement for Northern Ireland. Um, you're probably aware of that in relation to uh, HMOs or as no regional policy, uh, nor is there any uh, local subject plan uh, or policy within the dairy area plan. So um, the, the principal policy for assessing the application is contained within the SPPS. Uh, a number of uh, consultees' um, uh, opinions were sought during the application process. Uh, DFA um, indicated that for a, a HMO of this scale, four bedrooms, that two car parking spaces would normally be required. Uh, and environmental health have no objections and have provided a standard and um, informative and recent HMOs uh, and the separate legislation uh, in, in relation to the licensing requirements for HMOs. Um, the application is before committee uh, on the grounds that there of the number of representations received. Um, there have been 52 objections um, contained within a, a petition. But 40, 40 of these objections were from separate individual households and therefore met the threshold uh, to, to come from delegated to committee. Um, the, the, the detail is set out in uh, the case officer's report, but also, uh, the main issues are in relation to the, the precedent uh, in terms of the introduction of H HMOs into the area and the impact or, uh, in terms of the change of character from an area that's predominantly family occupied. Uh, and there, there's concern what impact that would have on uh, Governor Road. Um, there's concerns in relation to the, the, the potential increase in disturbance in street noise parties, etc., and antisocial behaviour. Um, concerns uh, relating to parking problems uh, related both to the, the nearby residential or the nearby commercial properties in Strand Road uh, and uh, the, the potential for uh, more an increase in parking problems from the, the proposed property. Um, again, uh, there's issues relating to um, residential amenity in terms of noise coming from emanating from the house, uh, and then there's a uh, general issues then about the 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 the, the, the current occupiers of the of the dwelling and the impact that the change of use will have on those occupiers. In addition to to the petition, we received a, a letter of representation from a local MLA. Uh, the issues raised included uh, parking, uh, again, residential amenity, residential amenity for prospective tenants, and in particular was the the rear yard, yard area adequate for four adults, uh, and also um, the issue of, although that the planning history is only showing one HMO in area, the, the local MLA believe that there may be a prevalence of unauthorized HMOs that uh, are in the area. And they've also highlighted that there's an existence of a, a hostel uh, on the same street. So uh, again, going back to the policy consideration, the, the application is within the central area. 
and there's a general proposal from the central for protection of residential stock. However, um, we believe that the proposed conversion wouldn't conflict with that because it's essentially a residential end use, uh, and there would be no um, no divergence from that policy. In terms of residential mini for the occupiers of the HMO, the, the drawn shows small yard area, which is characteristic to vary given the number of properties, also of two story rear extensions. Um, it's also noted that this within walking distance to public open spaces, uh, such as the Bay Park and Foyle Embankment. Uh, it is, there's sufficient space for bun storage. Um, there's shared facilities within the dwelling, which would be a standard within HMO. Um, and it's also completed that the proposal complies with uh, the SPPS in general with regard to the revision of the immunity of the future occupants of the dwelling. Uh, so there's not a, an issue or of concern from the officers in relation to this, this point that was raised. In terms of uh, residential impact on nearby properties, um, the main concerns are potential for noise disturbance and impacts on privacy for nearby properties. Um, it is noted that there's no uh, operational development and there's no additional windows proposed or than what exists at present. Uh, as uh, should complaints arise in terms of noise and disturbance from future occupants, this would be subject to investigation by all our bodies, um, I would say planning, uh, as would be the case for uh, existing occupants in the street. Um, EHD have provided an informatives regarding noise transmitted from the proposed occupant of the HMO to neighbouring properties. Again, this will be subject to separate legislation uh, and uh, licensing procedures. Um, therefore, it is concluded uh, in respect of planning policy that the HMO would not adversely affect the immunity of those nearby residents and uh, will conform with the established character of the area and it complies with the SPPS. Um, in terms of impact on local character and the loss of family size accommodation, um, as mentioned earlier, that it's that we don't have a regional policy nor a subject uh, policy or local policy relating to HMOs. Um, whilst it is recognised that the area is um, primarily residential and um, predominantly single family occupation, we don't believe that the approval of one uh, further dwelling in the street to HMO will have a, a significant or adverse impact on the, the existing character, which will uh, remain uh, as it is predominantly single family occupied dwellings. Um, in terms of uh, the, there has been, there's 44 residential properties in the street. There's one um, record of a HMO approval in the street. So um, if this, uh, application is allowed where we we'll have two out of 44 residential properties uh, and if we feel that it's somewhat below the a threshold of change the character of the area um, in terms of parking provision um, i said it earlier road service believe that two spaces would be the requirement for a four bedroom hmo we have to take into consideration the fallback position and the, the, the existing dwelling is a free bedroom house, which could accommodate up to four adults, requiring uh, possibly a space for each car uh, and would have a similar parking requirement as per a four bedroom HMO. So we don't believe that that will be, it will result in any additional uh, parking requirement. Um, furthermore, um, the applicant has submitted a car parking survey and whilst it, it appears that there may be uh, some limitations that, that there, there, there was evidence of uh, availability of spaces um, during uh, the, the times set out in the, the report. Um, also, the case officer observed on site uh, uh, a similar situation uh, and Strand Road, um, the location of the the, the, the street uh, and it's at the central area and located to the main arterial route into the city, i.e. the Strand Road. It has uh, excellent you know, shopping and public transport opportunities within walking distance. Uh, so therefore, um, we don't believe that there's any requirement to provide additional car parking provision for the proposed development. 
Um, in terms of natural heritage, they're, they're, you know, given the nature of the change of use, there no issues will arise and the location, no issues will arise. Um, we've considered the NIH, NIH sorry, the Northern Ireland Housing Executive Standards. Whilst it's not a planning policy, it is acknowledged that the property has met these standards and is uh, considered to comply with the, 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 the standards set out uh, by that body. So in conclusion, um, we recommend that the, the proposal um, should changes should be allowed, um, the, given its location, uh, that it's in uh, compliance with the, the policy context, uh, and that it will not have a, an adverse impact on either individual residential part properties or the overall established character of the area. Um, all objections have been considered uh, and um, all our material considerations, such as uh, consultees, are considered, and therefore it is our recommendation to approve the application subject to the standard conditions as set out in the report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, Maliki. Uh, over to uh, Mr. Peter McCaffrey, the agent. If you'd like to speak, so you have five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, from yourself and the members to actually uh, present something here. Um, I may end up repeating some of the things that has been presented, so apologies for that if I do. Um, the planning um, department have completed a full report, as has been noted previously, on this application and provided a recommendation for approval. The report um, has had a balanced consideration, taking into account the objections lodged and the relevant planning policy framework documents and standards that's noted in section seven of the report. As has been highlighted, um, two of the key issues that um, I believe have come through as the main areas of concern is parking and noise. A parking survey was carried out, again as noted, and was submitted to the council for the review and consideration. The planning review noted that the change of use from a three bed dwelling to a four bed HMO dwelling would not result in any additional parking requirement. It's also noted that the proposed development will not have any, but will not have an unacceptable impact on the parking amenity enjoyed by the existing residents in the area. And the case officer concluded that the proposal complies with policy AMP7 of PPS3 and policy TR5 of the DAP. The issue of the unacceptable noise is outside the plan and control and could come from any household in the street. I believe that. This um, can be a personal view and potentially is an unfair view uh, noted in the objections that HMOs will be noisier than residential homes, which is not always the case. In October 2021, um, there was an approval granted to change of use for a dwelling uh, to HMO at 3 Governor Road, that's uh, LA11 2021-0275F, as noted previously. This application also had a change in footprint with a two-story rear extension to accommodate a kitchen, bathroom and shower room in the application. There were no objections to the application and as noted, it was approved. There was turned an application um, being considered at 43 at Governor Road also, um, which uh, was touched on briefly, um, which is an extension to an existing hostel to provide 10 additional rooms which will have a change uh, with ensuite bath bedrooms which will have a change in footprint as well there's been one objection uh, present to that application this again will be a change to the current footprint of the property my application is not changing the existing footprint as was noted to the property at all either internally or externally and it's had 53 objections sorry 52. i do appreciate that the local residents may be reluctant to see new types of accommodation coming into the area, which I acknowledge. However, I do believe in an inspiring and um, opportunity to grow and develop economically, there is a need for a number of HMOs in Derry in close proximity to the university. Currently, as again noted, there's only one HMO recorded in Governor Road, which is number three. The local development plan 2032 um, in that, there are numerous references made to economic development, housing, and the university growth. I believe this is an excellent document and very exciting. And it's great to see a vision and strategy for the city of this time. 
We have a growing university in the city with new departments and courses continuously coming on stream. We do need to provide accommodation for the students who will come to Derry to study, invest in the city, and hopefully stay on after their studies and contribute to the growing economy the LDP wants to see. I do know that McGee University is obviously addressing the accommodation issues, but I also know um, that they need support in doing that as well because they're not in a position to cover all accommodation for all students coming uh, to the city. There's a few, um, there's quite a few uh, references in the LDP um, which relate to economic growth and development relating to workforce and housing. Just a couple of those to note. In section four of the LDP is noted that an objective is to create 15,000 new jobs by 2032. Part of this will come from an upskilled workforce with tertiary education. In section 16.1, it is noted that the LDP will play a role in the delivery of homes to meet full range of housing needs throughout Derry City and Strabane District. In conclusion, Chair, I would like, I would ask for your considered review and pragmatic rationale in considering this application in line with the planning team's recommendation for approval. Thanks a lot. Thank you for that, Peter. Uh, have any of the members got questions for Peter? Chair, oh. Chair, Chair Patricia Lowe, can I come in here, please? Certainly, go ahead, Patricia. Yeah, uh, hello, Peter, and uh, thank you uh, for your presentation. Peter, um, I just want to go back to the, the 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 room sizes, and I know the the planning officer has has said that it does comply with um, the minimum space standards. Can you just um, uh, it's not very clear looking at it in the plans here, but can you just uh, advise me uh, on the size of the living room, kitchen, dining areas? And can you also advise, is there bathrooms on the second floor or on both floors? Thank you. And, and just another thing regarding the parking. Now, uh, I think there is a wee bit of an issue here. The DFI roads did come in and say that this would require uh, two parking spaces. Um, so um, there, there is an issue there uh, with parking too as well. But I would be keen to hear about the the size of the of the of those rooms mentioned, please. Thank you, and where they're located. Thanks, Councillor. Hey. Look, um, sorry. No, go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Um, my understanding um, is, as I mentioned, there's no change in any of the interior or exterior, exterior um, current footprint of the house. There is um, appropriate bathroom facilities on the first floor. Um, I'm just whilst I'm talking to you here, I'm just I've just pulled up my plans. The and there is a um, a bathroom on the ground floor as well. Um, you asked about the I think you asked about the size of the living and kitchen space. So a living area of eleven square meters and a kitchen space of nine square meters, which is standard of those houses, um, terraced houses in Governor Road. Um, I guess the parking issue that you touched on, from my perspective, um, I think it was highlighted in the in the summary that was presented previously, is that if you've got a company, if you've got a, a house of this type, where it can have up to four adults, from a residential perspective, you could have up to four um, charges as well too that needs to be accommodated. So I don't see any difference between that and HMO um, use of the property. Hopefully that's addressed those questions. Mr. Lowe, do you wish to uh, comment on those answers? Um, uh, no, thanks for that, Peter, but I, I would have to disagree with you regarding parking. There would be no difference. I, I think you're, you're uh, comparing apples with oranges here. You know, a family unit um, 
normally if there's visitors to that home, it's only one car where you would have four separate people here. They, there could be four different sets of visitors, four different sets of delivery vans, four cars. So uh, I, I do think there is a bit of a difference when you're looking at parking for a HMO uh, and flats than that of a uh, one family unit um, home. That's my opinion. Thanks, Any more questions for Peter? Chair, I had it in the chat box. It didn't come through, but go ahead, Councillor Dobbins, please. Thanks, thanks very much. And um, it looks like myself and Patricia, we've been here before. Um, and basically, is, it's a three bed house yeah, and it's a small terraced house with, with a back return on it. And you can't swing a cat. No. Um, Peter, you, you did make reference. My, my question here that I've written in my notebook was uh, three bedrooms upstairs and they they look by the design that they hold a double bed, but uh, by the looks of them, they're not going to hold much else. Um, and they're and a tiny, tiny bathroom upstairs. Now, I do not see a bathroom downstairs. What I do see is a WSC. And being, um, I do know those houses, that there is a small downstairs toilet only. So therefore it cannot be classed as a bathroom. Um, I, you couldn't swing a cat in those rooms. That's a three bed house, um, Peter, which you're putting into a four bed HMO. Now HMO, um, I assume that you're thinking on four single people. What if it was three and a couple? There is not. Um, it, it's not to me suitable for um, any sort of people, even students. And like you're surmising students because uh, the, of the nearby um, Ulster University. Um, I, I just do not, I'm sorry, but I do not see a HMO and, and a house on that terrace at all. It's more family oriented. And there's a lot of families out there who would snap at the chance of a three bed house or even a four bed if you take, take down the uh, move the, the room downstairs into a bedroom. There's a lot of families out there. Now, the car parking facilities, that place is awful. And there is a hostel at the top. There is a hostel at the top there, which I would have concerns about as well, that it does generate a lot of traffic as well to an, uh, a throne from from di various different um, organizations that use that hostel so i i just don't see i don't see the appropriateness of those rooms nor the bathroom facilities nor even the outside now um there will be a question for the officer with regard to that but um i just don't see it as a hmo peter i'm sorry but i think that in our as a planning committee, we have to step up to the plate here and say there is a standard that we should be um, approving upon within people living, even uh, a HMO or single flats or anything else, you know, that there's a standard that we should, there's a a, 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 a marker there that we should be approaching uh, to allow things like this and just not saying to people, you know, oh, well, you take it or leave it. And to me, to move a three bedroom, small terraced house and a four bed HMO, no, I just don't see the reasoning behind it. Thanks, Peter. Peter, would you like to uh, reply there to Councillor Lowe? Sorry, Councillor uh, Dobbins. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Councillor, for those comments. Um, look, I, I, um, I hear what you're saying there. I guess coming back to it um, and coming back to some of the facts, there's standards and there's policies in place. Uh, the planning department have gone through the parking survey that was submitted. Um, they've assessed that against the, uh, the requirements and standards that was noted in their recommendation report. I, I, I absolutely understand that we will all have gut feelings and perceptions around how that might play out. Um, I guess uh, I would disagree in that it's, it is a, from a student perspective, that is the intent, and that's what it will be used for. 
and we can mix and match as much as we want with regards to a three bed residential. Um, each of those being double rooms because that's the way they are. And um, when you look at the number of people, then that can can add up to. But there's there's numerous combinations um, around that. And with regards to with regards to the parking, look, I'm coming back to that. Um, it has been assessed. It's had a it's had a parking survey that's been done and been submitted. It has been assessed, and I'm I I can't say anything more in in and around that from that perspective. The uh, the professional planning team have have done what they've done and they've come up with that recommendation. I guess we also think from a residential point of view that students live in the same way as as a residential home. Um, they don't. Uh, they they actually will spend a lot of time out of the property. They'll spend time in the university studying and using um, facilities there uh, for that. Um, I guess look just the bigger picture though. I, I do think, and I've and I've made my comments um, previously with regards to economic growth and development in the university. We've been looking at year for years of getting the university here. There's a context and actually getting some really good courses into the area, which has been brilliant to see. With the vision and the strategy of the LDP 20 to 32, I also wonder what are we actually doing here to help develop and grow that and to work with that to make things happen, to bring in students into the area, to enable that to happen, to enable growth, to bring in, um, to address those 15,000 jobs that people want to see coming through by 2032. That's the bigger picture um, for me, and that's what, what I'm passionate about is actually providing um, a bit of that service to enable uh, that to happen. Thanks, Chair. Any more questions for uh, Peter? Okay, questions, Officer, and I believe Angela wishes to come in here. Thank you, Chair. And um, I. Uh, my notes again now. The the policy H1. Now I have a question mark beside that. Housing design. And as I have alluded to earlier, it's a three bed um going into a four bed HMO. And I, I would tend to agree with the existing residents on their list um only on A, B, and C. Now um D and and E I didn't um I'm sitting on the fence with, but I agree with the objection regarding the hostel at at the top of the street. Um, that that does, and if you've seen it, I do travel that that them roads on a daily basis, and it is bedlam. Now, what they're saying um, to the officer, what they're saying is two two car parking spaces, right? Now that's rule of thumb. Right. If you have four single people, and I keep saying if you have four single people, they've travelled from somewhere else, um, whether they're at university or wherever, to be in the city or near the city. So therefore they have a car. So that's four cars. And uh Councillor Logue was right when she alluded to other um visitors and deliveries and things like that. The residents in, in that street, um, yeah. They have their own cars, and it is an average two car per household. So, therefore, I I just I disagree with with that. And the smallness of the outside. I know that you were saying there is the Bay Road Park, and there's you know the walkway. There is amenity around the area, but amenity you have to go outside your house to have that amenity. You know, you can't go out into your back backyard and maybe sit for a breath of fresh air because there's no room. But um, I just I am telling here, Chair, not to be agreeing with the officer's recommendation. Um, I don't think it complies with the SPPS at all. I don't think there's a residential amenity. I think the, the rooms are far too small. They're not on a standard for um, anybody. And I know that, as as alluded to, that. There, there's no policy with regarding to um, standards of living conditions, but you know you can't put somebody into a box room, w which only holds a double bed, no room to put clothes or storage or anything else. I I, 
I just I don't agree with this at, at all. And it it really is. I think we're substandardizing um if, if with approval, we're substandardizing a uh, future HM, HMOs, people who want to do HMOs in the city and saying, well, you can do this, you know, box rooms are okay. Uh, and to that toilet facility, uh, that is a really small for four separate four separate adults to make use of. Um, I, I I don't see it. Uh, I'm sorry, like if, if the rooms were on suites and or or reducing the size of the rooms, like I'm, I may have a different opinion, but uh, at this point in time, I don't. Thanks, Chair. Peter Dobbins, uh, Maliki, do you want to come back? I suppose uh, there are two main issues uh, uh, in relation to parking policy and the size of the rooms. I suppose I'll, I'll start with parking policy uh, and go over the the context of, uh, of the of the, the application and its location. The application is located within the central area um, as part of the area, area plan. So as part of the plan led system, we have to give due regard to the, the policy requirements uh, for the central area. And it does have particular provisions in relation to car parking. So for the central area, uh, it's, uh, it's known as Zone B within policy TR5. Um, it uh, effectively says that parking can be provided you know, for development, but it's at the discretion of the the the, the, the officer or the, the the council, uh, depending on the circumstances of the case. So, uh, in relation to road service comments, there they, they indicated that a, a three bedroom house would require, sorry, a four bedroom HM would require two parking spaces. But if you look at the parking standards, which are oh, yeah. published. Oh, yeah. Sorry, so I've got a feedback here, sorry. Um, if you look at the, the published parking standards, is which is how we assess uh, requirements and how DFA road service would assess requirements for parking, there's pretty much uh, the same requirement for a HMO uh, as per a free bedroom house. What we're saying here is that that uh, an effect equals each other out. You know, you know there is no um, requirement to um, uh, on the basis of what the fallback position is in terms of the existing house, the, the existing permission. There is no uh, additional requirement above and beyond what is already existing uh, uh, as per the standards. Uh, and also going back to the point about the dairy area plan and the central area and the discretion the TR5 gives. We have uh, have given width to the the, the location. Um, in particular, it's it's it's, it's near um, public transport routes from walking distance to facilities. Um, we've also taken into context the uh, in consideration the, the the evidence submitted by the applicant and the case officer's observations. So, which we're saying there's no additional spaces needed. It was there was evidence to suggest that there was. Uh, on the occasions that the site was visited, there was on street parking available. Uh, so, look, and it's granted, yes, people may visit properties. Um, that's the same case for a resident, the existing residential property, if it remained as is. So, we don't, we don't see uh, any net difference uh, in terms of the applying the policy and the standards set out. Uh, in terms of the, the bedroom provision, um, again, I reiterate, we, we don't have a, a HMO policy, uh, either a regional level or a subject plan or local plan stage. Uh, therefore, um, we, we can only assess the application on the policy requirements set out. So planning policy currently, because there's no requirement um, to assess the, the bedroom size. Um, we are aware that there's separate legislation under the HMO Northern Ireland Act, um, which all our licensing bodies, such as environmental health, have to consider. Uh, and uh, certainly in terms, as the KISS Office report set out, the, the bedroom sizes are, we appear to be in compliance with it, but that's of no uh, width to the decision we made. It's just an observation made uh, for information for the members. Thank you. Logue, is this a question for the officer or are you wishing to propose something? For the officer. 
Thank you for that. Yep. Hello, uh, Malachi. Thank you. Um, just to get back to the parking again, because I am somewhat confused. Um, you have said that um, you know you, you you're looking at this um, by on-site visits, um, by the car parking survey that was done, and you're comparing it to if it was a house uh, just of um, a three-bedroom house and what people would be required there. Why then are DFI roads advising? And they are statutory consultee advising that there is a requirement for a three parking spaces. Um, well, what we have before us is a, an application for a change use. So they were saying if the use, if that use uh, was approved, that is the parking requirement for that use. So that 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 is a. Uh, you know, if you suppose if you imagine that no dwelling existed here and you were just putting a HMO there, that would be the standard for a HMO of that size. Suppose uh, so what we're saying is that we we accept that we accept that that is the standard and we don't dispute that. But what we uh, as officers are taking into account is amongst amongst the factors that you laid out there um, is the the existing uh, requirement for parking for the existing dwelling. Uh, and I suppose if it was a case that there was a difference, we would seek, you know, that difference to seek to factor that in. So um, if there was a difference of one or two, you're free. Uh, we would seek to uh, address that on that. No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Thank you. And ju just chair, if you will allow me, you know, uh, another councillor has mentioned the the standards, uh, space standards, etc. And even though we, as uh, decision makers and planning, have no uh, authority over, um, you know, the space standards within uh, HMOs, etc., I do believe that we have uh, we have a moral uh, obligation, and that, um, as well as that. Those that are responsible for um, authorizing the licenses for HMOs as council. So I do believe that you know we as uh, councillors need to be aware of the overall um, overall standards that are needed in order for someone to to get that license. And I do also believe that the health and welfare uh, of certain planning proposals need to have positive outcomes uh, for the tenants that are already there, for the tenants that are going to live on that property, and for the local neighbourhood. And I do believe that that which should be given under material uh, considerations. Regarding uh, standards, thank you. But uh, Councillor Logue, uh, Councillor Dobbins, do you wish to speak about your proposal? I, I do, Chair. If nobody else wants to speak, and, and I, I would like on air to um, just say to Councillor Logue, you know, I'm glad the two of us are singing from the same hymn sheet. Um, there definitely, definitely has to be a health and welfare of existing residents in that area um, or any area where there's a, a, a proposal of a HMO and for the future occupiers of that HMO, there has to be standards set. Um, but with regard to that, um, I, I would like to make a proposal at that um, I'm not I'm not happy with uh, the conclusion and recommendations here stated. And therefore I would um, propose that we refuse um, this application on the basis that is not um, the proposed HMO development at this location at this location is not an acceptable form of development um, and will have uh, an adverse effect on the established character in this area and that the proposal provides an unacceptable living environment for its residents uh, and that's that's my proposal chair that um, that we refuse acceptance on this. Thank you. 
for the second. Um, Councillor Boyle indicated he wished to come in and speak just before I put this to the floor and get a second. Chair, did you invite me in to ask a question? Indeed, Councillor Boyle, yeah. Yes, Chair, that's, that's a question for our officer, uh, Malagy. Malagy, just to be clear, um, you did say, effectively, I'm asking you to correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you, you did uh, say that there is no ex there is no extant HMO policy um, in relation to, um, for want of a better way of putting it, living space within a property. Uh, uh, is that correct? Um, thank you, Councillor Boy. Yes, um, but there, there is no. We don't. We don't have a planning policy in relation to HMO and. There is no specific planning policy at HMO, so our planning consideration is uh, dealt with under the broad um, uh, principles of planning set out in the, the strategic planning policy statement in relation to things like residential character and amenity, etc. So there, there is no specific uh, policies for HMOs, either within the regional policy or within our development plan. Thank you. So, arguably, then this committee could form a view um, in the absence of an extant uh, HMO policy and take each and every individual HMO that uh, is implied, applied in front of the committee on its own merits. That, that would arguably, this committee might take a view on that uh, in, the, uh, in the absence of a policy that directs them to do otherwise. Well, the, the, sorry. If we come back on there, Councillor Boyle, is the, I'm not saying there is no absence of policy, but there's an absence of a specific HMO policy. There's still a policy consideration set out within the SPPS and the other policies within the dairy area plan is set out in the report. But there is no, to go back to your original question, there's no specific HMO policy that sets out room sizes or uh, et cetera. So, um, Officers and members would still be required to consider the the policy context as set out uh, in the case officer's report. Okay, I appreciate that, Maliki, and appreciate the answers to that as well. Uh, I was really only following up, Chair, on, on the back of some of the some of the questions that Councillors Dobbins and Luke um, were asking, and uh, just for the benefit of not only myself but but other other members in the committee. So uh, I, I leave it at that, and thank you for the. Um, Thank you for the answer to that, Molly. Members, can I have a seconder for uh, Councillor Dobbins' proposal, please? To speak, Molly? Sorry, just to, to make another point on the, the plan and policy, and just for members' information, we have. Uh, in recent years, uh, I suppose 2017, 2018, 2019, dealt with a number of appeals uh, relating to HMOs. Uh, and uh, you may recall uh, Barry Street, uh, Lawrence Hill, and Grafton Terrace. Um, they set out yeah, the, the, the issues that, um, in, in detail that I suppose that you've raised, Councillor Boyle, and what is the, the policy context for uh, assessing HMOs. Uh, and assessing, um, I think in the past, um, policy was misapplied, I suppose, in uh, uh, the opinion of the PAC in terms of using PPS 7 addendum. But uh, we set out that the SPPS uh, uh, is the, the relevant policy uh, uh, in terms of assessing uh, the impact on residential character and residential immunity. Thank you, Chair. That, Maliki, thank you for that clarification. Okay, members, we have a proposal from uh, Councillor Dobbins. Do we have a seconder? Chair, can I ask what that proposal was again, please? Yes. Yeah, the proposal is to refuse the officer's recommendations on the basis that the proposed HMO will have an adverse effect on the area. An unaccepted living living environment. I'll second that chair, but I, I would also like to include uh, it goes against PTSD. 
Well, could you just clarify there what you said there, please? Yeah, I would agree with that, but could we also include the reason for uh, refusing is that uh, it is against TPS3. Thank you for that, Angela. Oh, sorry, thank you for that, uh, Patricia. Okay, it's out to the floor. We're going to take a vote now. Uh, yeah, can you take a vote, please, um, Maura? Thank you, Chair. Okay, members. Members, you're voting in regard to item one and recommendation to refuse and not accept officer's recommendation. Alderman Alan Breslin. Could you say that again, what you just after saying, please? Yeah. So what we're voting on here is that um, the proposal is not to accept the officer's recommendation and to refuse the planning application. Right. I'm against that. Okay. Thank you, Alderman Alan Breslin. Alderman Derek Hussey, still apologies. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. I'll abstain on that one, Mara. Okay, thank you, Keith. Alderman Hilary McClintock. For the proposal to go against the officer's recommendation. Thank you, Hilary. Councillor Jason Barr. Uh, because I wasn't here to the start, Mara, I'll abstain. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor John Boyle. Or. Thank you. Councillor Ansel Dobbins. Or Maura. Thank you. Councillor Paul Gallagher. Councillor Gallagher. I can't look left to me. You need to put a message up. Okay. Councillor Christopher Jackson. Councillor Jackson. Sorry, Chair Maura. I think uh, Maura. Sorry. I think Christopher had some uh, connection problems. Okay, thank you. Councillor Dan Kelly. For Mara. Thank you. Councillor Patricia Logue. For. Thank you. Councillor Kieran Maguire. Councillor Maguire. Apologies. Oh, that's right. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Reminding me, Councillor Philip McKinney. Stan. And Councillor Sean Mooney. Or. Thank you. So that's six, four, one against, and one, two, three abstentions. Okay, so, so the, the proposal, proposal is carried right. to object the officer's decision. Thank you. Members, we're going to move on to application two and three, which are going to be heard together by Maliki, and it's LA112020082. And LA one one two zero two one zero zero seven four DCA, and we have one speaker, which is Mr. Tate. Thank you. All again. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, items two and three: LA eleven twenty twenty zero eight three four F and LA eleven twenty twenty one zero zero seven four DCA are a full application and an app of demolition consent application for the change of use from office building into 11 bedroom HMO incorporating a three story rear extension and demolition of existing rear return and out buildings respectively. Uh, the image before you shows the, the site location as outlined in red, uh, the site is located is a N Terrace property on Dacre Terrace, which looks on to Carlisle Circus. Uh, it is located within the commercial core and the historic city conservation area. Um, the, the property 
as you'll see from the next image, is a, a three and a half story Mount Terrace dwelling. Uh, as I say, it's within the conservation area currently. Uh, the property is vacant, but the last known use was a, it was an office. It sits adjacent to the, the listed building here at Carlyle Road and the Church of Carlyle Road. Uh, and uh, the image here will show you from the, the property from the rear and the extension to be uh, demolished as part of the demolition consent application. So on the, the left side, side of the image here, we have the, the existing floor plans uh, of the, um, the last own use as an office, uh, as well as the, the roof plans of the, the rear return. Uh, and then on the, the right side, we have the, the proposed uh, um, floor plans, um, which the, with the thicker black, uh, black line is the, the existing footprint of the dwelling and uh, to the rear, is the proposed three-storey uh, rear extension. Uh, and here's our uh, proposed elevations. Again, on the left-hand side, we have the, the existing elevations. Um, primarily concerning the, the side rear, because that's where the operational development in terms of the extension will take place. So uh, you can see the, the existing um, single-storey rear return at the back uh, uh, with the, the and again, on the right hand side, we can um, see the proposed um, three story rear extension. Uh, the windows will be looking back in towards uh, number two, uh, Dacre Terrace, and uh, the blank elevation will be looking towards the, the church at uh, Carlyle Road. So the policy context for um, the applications uh, set out in the RDS, the SPPS. The dairy area plan uh, and particular policies related to the conservation area uh, and uh, the central area. Uh, and like our previous application, the SPPS uh, in terms of the proposed use. Uh, and again, policy TR5 is relevant in terms of care park and provision uh, and the, in terms of the location uh, and PPS free in terms of care parking uh, and uh, for the proposed development. Uh, and further this, in particular in relation to the, the demolition consent, uh, the policies within PPS 6 in relation to conservation area, uh, and given its location as well, um, there's consideration for monuments, etc. Um, a number of uh, statutory consultees were consulted in relation to the application. The FA roads um, indicated due to its location within the commercial core. Uh, and, uh, and parking is not normally a requirement, all are in service, and so they, they, um, they don't have uh, any detailed comment they make on the application, given the, the policy context. Environmental Health um, indicated that, it's the, because of the busy nature of the road, there may be a need for an air quality assessment um, in terms of impact on potential, potential residents as a result of traffic. Uh, and they've also provided standard informants related to noise and HMOs. And HED build, buildings um, advise that they consider the proposal as no greater demonstrable harm on the significance of the adjacent list of building. So therefore, they have no, raised, no issues. And HED monuments is content, satisfactory, sat, content, um, subject to uh, normal policy, uh, sorry, conditions. Um, the application is before members. It's been referred in by a member uh, for consideration. Um, but as noteworthy, we have had four objections also to the applications from four separate uh, bodies. So um, they're summarised here that uh, in terms of the, the adverse impact on light to parts of the adjacent church from the proposed extension, there's concerns regarding the the stained glass, the protection of stained glass windows during construction, um, what provision has been made to access the building during construction, concerns regarding uh, members of the church congregation as a result of potential impacts on parking. Um, there's no, uh, there's no uh, information on the proposed fire escape, what risks proposals will be made regarding the occupancy of the property. The proposal will not generate regenerate the area, will have a negative impact on regeneration by not bringing in commercial value. 
proposals detrimental to the vitality and viability of the area. The proposal is out of character for all our businesses in the area. Concerns over safety and security of the street. Uh, the proposal is not suitable. And the proposal of approved would add to existing antisocial behaviour in the locality. And that it's not in keeping with the dairy area plan. In terms of policy consideration and term, uh, impact on character, um, the area is currently uh, at the age of the town centre. Um, it's in a gateway location coming into the, the city centre. Uh, and Dacre Terrace is um, currently characterised by a, a mixed use of development, including retail, uh, commercial, um, residential, uh, professional services offices, and community offices. Um, the proposal would result in, uh, you know, a primarily a residential end use, given the, the nature of the HMO uh, in terms of character. Um, the, the operational development is limited to the rear, um, the three-storey extension. Um, is, it would not be readily visible from uh, important views in terms of the, the character of the area, and, and particularly in terms of the impact on the conservation area. And the dairy area plan, um, talks about um, uh, a preference for office conversions at this location. The, the proposals revert to the building's original residential use, uh, which it should be noted that um, the change from office to back to residential does not require planning permission. So in effect, there is a fallback position for the applicant uh, in respect of that, and therefore officers are considered. And this is not only a, a change of use from an office to um, HMO, but from the possibility of considering it from the fallback position from a, a residential property to H HMO. <coughs> In terms of uh, an impact on neighbouring immunity, um, the proposed extension is to be positioned along the northeast boundary uh, near to the church. Uh, it's acknowledged that it's, uh, it's greater in scale and height than, than the existing uh, extension to be, uh, to be replaced. Um, the extension um, may have impact on the light received by some of the closest church ones. Those houses are not considered to be significantly adverse uh, when viewed in the context of the site, um, given it's in a built up urban setting. It's within the central area and effectively within the, the city centre, and where immediately adjacent development is not residential in use. Uh, so therefore, um, we do not I believe that there is a, a, an impact. Uh, on a sensitive receptor as set out in the SPPS. Um, HED has no objection in terms of proposals impact uh, on the setting of the list of Paldon or the historic city walls. Uh, and officers do not believe that there will be any adverse impact on the setting of the conservation area. Uh, the proposal is considered to be in uh, accordance with the provisions of uh, policy BE1 of the area plan. Uh, the, a small yard area is, in terms of residential needed for the occupiers, a small yard area is to be provided, um, which is sufficient for the purposes of bun storage. Uh, there's open space nearby at Foy Road, uh, and environmental health requested a sample screening for air quality uh, and provided advice for applicant and noise reduction. Uh, the site is not located within an air quality management area, uh, and as noted earlier, the owner could revert to the building's original use as a single dwelling under permit development. Therefore, it was not considered necessary uh, uh, to insist on the provisions of such air quality given the fallback position of the applicant. Overall, the proposal complies with the SPPS with regard to the provision of amenity of future occupants of the dwelling. In terms of parking, um, it's recognised that the parking is currently limited given the nature of the, the on, on street nature at Abercorn Road and Carlyle Road. But a uh, significant width in this case would be given to the fact that the site is within Zone A of the dairy area plan, which uh, which uh, which there's, says that there's no requirement for additional parking. Um, Furthermore, as an aside, there's a fallback position uh, again in relation to the original residential use of the dwelling, which uh, would have been an eight-bedroom residence. So it's reasonable to assess that the eight-bedroom house would have a similar parking requirement to the proposal. Um, but again, greater width is given to Zone A, policy TR5 in this case.
given the, the the scale, nature, and location, there's no concerns regarding uh, national heritage. Um, again, we recognise that there's NIEHE standards. Um, we don't have to determine them with that. We're aware of them uh, in this case. In terms of the conservation area and proximity to listed buildings and historic walls, um, we recognise that, uh, that its location, but we do not believe, uh, given the limited views of the, the operational development, that the that the contribution of the to the CEA will, will have been diminished in any way. Um, HED are the statutory consultee in terms of impacts on the settings of listed buildings, uh, and they have uh, offered no objection. Uh, and uh, there's no objection in terms of uh, historic walls uh, or monuments also in relation to development. Um, in terms of the sorry, just go by that slide. In terms of the demolition, the 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 existing extension um, again was very a very limited views of the existing extension and wasn't a prominent feature in the conservation area. So the loss of that feature um, won't have an overall adverse impact on the conservation area. So, in conclusion, um, we recommend that the, the change of use and the demolition consent is granted on the basis that the proposal uh, meets the current policy framework uh, in terms of the SPPS and the dairy area plan and the other uh, retained regional plan and policies. Uh, all objections have been considered uh, in the case officer's report and factored on the, the recommendation. Uh, and uh, is recommend that the proposal complies with policy and approval uh, should be granted, should is recommended to members. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. Well, Chair Maliki, I'm going to um, now call on Mr. Tate to speak on behalf of the agent. You have five minutes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, we okay? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Hopefully, we can clear up a few issues and answer any questions. This building has been derelict for a number of years, and as this building is a prominent location coming into our city, I feel we have an opportunity to restore this building. I'd like to run through the objection letters and clear up any issues. The letter from the Fountain Primary School has concerns regarding the use and that this proposal is not in keeping with the area. This application is for an HMO. It will be used by young professionals. The only alterations to the front elevation will be, will be to paint the building and replace the existing sliding size windows to match the existing. Regarding the letter from the Cathedral Youth Club, their letter refers to an existing B&B. &B. This application has nothing to do with the B&B, &B, and this is for an HMO. If we could move on to the third objection from Baston Property Limited. They have concerns also about the use and that this should be a commercial building. As previously stated, our works are not altering the front of the building and, there, and that there was offices at this location previously which did not, which, which weren't viable, hence the reason why the building is derelict for a number, number of years. They also state that the proposal is detrimental to the area. It is my opinion that the way the derelict building is at present, it is more detrimental to what we are proposing. Finally, the last objection from Carlisle Road Presbyterian Church. They raise concerns, concerns regarding car parking, construction work, fire escapes, and blocking the light. This proposal does not require car parking as, we've, as is within the city centre. DFI Roads have cleared the proposal. And also, when you weigh this up uh, to the previous use of offices with large staff and customer numbers, I feel that this application won't cause any additional parking issues. Regarding the construction work, my client can access the works via his own property, but we'll have no issues in meeting the adjacent landowners and building owners uh, to discuss any on-site issues. This proposal does not require a fire escape as it will comply with the current building regulations. Finally, regarding the issue with blocking the light, we are proposing a rear extension. The building at present has a large extension already to the rear, which we will be demolishing. This area is already built up with Decker Terrace and a large retaining wall to the rear, so the light already is restricted. This HMO has a large living area of 30 square metres. 
a kitchen of approximately 12 square meters. It has a bathroom on every floor and every bedroom has an ensuite. So I hope this clears up any issues. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, uh, Alderman McClintock, you have a question for uh, Mr. Tate. Yes, thank you, Chair. Hello, Andy. Thank you for attending this afternoon. As you say, this is a very important uh, position that this application is for. It's a gateway location uh, into a historic part of the city. Um, my question is regarding the 10 or 11 people sharing one kitchen of 11.4 square metres. My experience of even in a university, when you might have 10 or 11 people sharing a uh, a kitchen, usually it would be bigger than that, and it will also be very well regulated. But I heard you say there that the um, end users, you would expect them to be young professionals. I suppose my question is, I cannot think that any young professionals would be willing to share a kitchen with all that number of people. I would imagine um, that the, the uh, possible end users would be of a very transient nature. I don't even see students wanting to, to take this, um, this sort of a, a property to, to stay in. So I suppose I can, I'm very concerned just as to how transient the end users might be considering that it's next door to um, a listed property of the church that's about 180 odd years old or whatever. So I just welcome your comments around the kitchen size. And I agree that the lounge is of a fair size, but 10 or 11 people sharing a, a kitchen of 11.4 square metres. What, what young professionals are going to put up with that? Thank you. I'm going to um, also ask uh, uh, Councillor Lowe to come in here because she has a question as well for the um, agent. Go ahead, um, Councillor Lowe. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Mr. Tate. Um, I suppose it's, it's along the same vein, and I know I'm very, very aware uh, that base standards is not a and, uh, planning consideration. How, however, we I, I do believe we have a moral duty, and we cannot just be granting um, uh, planning applications to to proposals where the space standards would fall way and below what we would want for our own children. And I'm very, very, we're looking to grow, we're looking to do all different things at university places. But you did say, you didn't say they may be, you did say that these uh, rooms would be occupied uh, with young professionals. I don't know how you, you can guarantee that statement, and I, I do have to agree with uh, Alderman McClintock that, you know, if I was a young professional, not even if I was a young professional, if I was anybody, I would not want to share my kitchen with uh, 10 or more uh, other residents. I think it's virtually impossible. I do have to commend that there is a, an ensuite on each bedroom. That is, uh, that is improving, uh, an improvement in a lot of the HMOs that do come before us. However, I do, and I do agree with you that this will revitalise uh, an empty building, but you're also adding on to it, and it's that add-on part that I feel will have a detrimental impact on the tenants who are already live around that area, and uh, the the whole uh, the whole um, historic. Uh, uh, conservation area. Thank you. So I don't know, uh, sorry, I don't know if they're questioning that, but uh, if anybody wants to respond to that, thank you. Mr. Tate, if you'd like to come back for those uh, comments, please. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, well, the kitchen area would be prim primarily for cooking areas. Um, as I said before, the lounge area is approximately 30 square meters. Now, that area can be used for dining and living as well as that. Um, I know we can't, you can't guarantee it's all young professionals, like you know. So, uh, I, I take that point. Um, but I would say I've done a lot of HMOs in the past. The one last one was in Lawrence Hill, and I 
I've been over at it quite often. And I, I can also say I've been over at different times. And any time I've been there, it was a large, a large HMO, and there's been a maximum of two people in the kitchen the one time at any time I've been over. So not everybody will be eating at the same time, all different times of the day. So, you know, this, this HMO here that we're proposing is a big building. There's lots of space. And it's just an opportunity for this area rather than leave the building line derelict. Thank you. Boyle. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, hey, Andy, John Boyle here. Andy, just two questions for you. Um, first one really is, uh, is more a matter of interest, I suppose, but how long is it actually laying vacant for? That's the first question. Second question is, as I understand it, that, that uh, this building falls within uh, what is referred to as the flat zone. I'm sure you know what that means. Um, uh, and it seems that there has been no consideration given to the development of flats uh, in this building. Um, why might that have been the case? Given the previous questions from um, Alderman McClintock and, uh, and Councillor Logan and their references to the suitability of a HMO, So uh, sorry, what, what was your first question again, John? Sorry. Uh, simply how long has it been lying empty? Oh, sorry, yes. Um, it's over five years it's been vacant. And the flats, um, it's never never considered to be flats, to be honest. Um, the land proposed in HMO, if, if, if you were going for flats, you could be going for two or four or five, two, or six two bed apartments, you know, you've the same the same problems, same you're gonna have the same issues like. So it's just it was never brought up as my clients proposed in HMO and the flats were never discussed. Okay, Andy, um uh thanks for that. Um I'll I'll certainly bear that in mind. Um but uh, you know it certainly isn't something that should have been beyond the thinking of of the client, I think. Um, but again, that's not your decision. Um, uh, that's that's up to your client. But certainly, I think it's an important question to ask because it would be inside the flat zone, um, and and those kitchen problems may well then not have been referenced today. More questions for the agent for Andy? Yes, chair. Chair, I'm trying to hear. I'm on the chat box. Hello. Hello, Chair. Can you hear me? Yeah, I've got John. Oh, sorry. Please go ahead, sorry. please. Yep, okay. sorry about that. Thank you. Um, hi, Andy. Andy, it's just with regard. Um, yeah, I, I've it written here down. Um, I really appreciate that those rooms, um, are are have a have an ensuite, which uh is a pet hit. Of not it's not a pet hit of mine, but it it is something that has been risen in the past. But I, I do agree with uh, previous speakers with the kitchen facility being small. And actually what I had written here was, and I would have no problem with this if this was separate apartments. Um, but the mere fact that it is HMO and therefore, you know, especially 11 of them. Um, what I was, what I would like to ask you, Andy, was there was mention of office space. Um, can I ask where where actually that came into it, or is that a consideration that, um, rather than living quarters, so that it could provide, um, office spaces? You know, because of the area where it's situated. Thanks, Andy. Hi, if you want to answer. I uh, the previous use was offices, and obviously, um, it's my understanding that never never worked out. That's why the building's derelict. So, um, same again. Offices never. It was never, never uh, brought up to me. They they go back at it, but um, as always, my clients attention to doing HMO. So, I can't um, comment on any previous uses for I don't know enough about it. To be honest. Oh, do you have a question for Andy? It's maybe not a question, but just maybe, uh, well, I suppose it is. Um, under the legislation, a HMO is for the 
uh, occupants who come under a number of categories. And I'll just read them, them out to you. It's for people who either in a uh, full-time education course, uh, uh, seasonal workers, and that would mean, uh, for me, seasonal work would mean for picking, etc. And for people who are, and for temporary accommodation, for people who have to forget, vacate their current loving property due to domestic violence and drug use, etc. You know, a HMO on the legislation is not um, to be classed as a home for a normal home for individuals. Those three categories of um, of uh, tenants. That's what. That's who should be the occupiers of HMOs. So I was just wondering, did they know that? Yeah, yeah, they do. Um, the client's done a lot of research on this. That's that's the reason why he was doing this for it. The reason I was just saying about young professionals is that you know you could be um, temporary work or whatever or traveling. Um, it's the end user is not. Not down to me. It's 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 to meet the legislation, as you say, as my client proposes. That's all I have to say on that one. Hey, thank you. Do we have any more questions for the agent? Okay. Any questions for the officer? Go ahead, Hillary. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Malachi, just I suppose for clarification, I know we have already um, talked about earlier on in the meeting today about the lack of specific HMO um, policies. Um, we're talking about the broad principles of planning. But I suppose I would just. Sorry, like, I'll phone you back and just at a meeting. Um, I suppose I would just like if you could uh, expand on I mean, do you think that 10 to 11 people? And with a kitchen of 11.4 square metres, that is an acceptable living uh, standard. And I suppose also the other thing I would like to raise, and, and, I, and I know it's not strictly a planning issue, is that the whole thing about antisocial behaviour in the area, can that be given any weight at all? Because we all know there are massive problems around that area um, already. And, you know, it's just a pity in some ways that the, that the SNI can't be invited to give a, a report about the number of incidents that there have been in this area already. So just wonder if you could comment on those. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alderman Um well, I mean, in terms of the, the first um, Query uh, and uh, written to the, the bedroom sizes, and we are eleven bedroom as appropriate. I, I suppose it's as planning officers we can only consider uh, what's uh, within the policy context. So uh, it's so I'd say our remit in terms of recommendation, like you no know, uh, to provide opinions on whether uh, eleven is a suitable form of development or whether the bedroom sizes are suitable. We can only uh, make an assessment on terms of what the, the planning policy allows us to they, they make an assessment on and our material considerations such as consultative responses and uh, representations. Um, there is separate legislation, you know, um, you know, applicants for HMOs are subject to separate legislation, uh, you know, which is, it's, I suppose, legislation is quite different from policy. Like, you know, so there is, you know, there's requirements within that legislation that they have to do out with planning. Uh, but I suppose to go back to the original question, we can only assess it on the the, 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 the broad uh, policy principles that set out in the SPPS as it states at the minute, and uh, we don't uh, can't go on the um, opinions on. Uh, Suppose on room sizes, etc. Like no, uh, in the current context. And sorry, what was the thing? Yeah, I, just, I, I was asking, did you consider it was an acceptable living standard? Really, was what I meant, and it was particularly regarding the kitchen rather than the bedrooms. Well, as I say, the, the policy doesn't uh, set out what an acceptable living standard is for officers. You know, um, so. 
I mean, it, it looks at the, the broader issues of whether it has an impact on the wider character of the area. Does it have an impact on residential amenity? Does it have an impact on parking? Uh, um, does uh, any operational development uh, have an impact on other policies, such as the, you know, uh, conservation areas or listed buildings? So, um, I mean, I, 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 you know, I don't have an opinion on it here um, from, from an officer's point of view. I don't know. Thank you for that, Maliki. Um, Councillor Lowe, do you have a question for the officer? Hey. Um, Maliki, I was just wondering, I was just looking at the consultation list, and um, I think I, count, I counted uh, 14 consultees, uh, or sorry, notification, neighbour notification list, and I think I counted uh, 14, give or take one or two. And then I compared that uh, with the, the notification list of previous applications. And one that stood out to me was the one for apartments in um, Northland Road. And there was, I think, 54 neighbour notifications. Um, there was no neighbour notifications along Abercorn Road at all which is a, a highly residential area. So I was just wondering what, um, what there's no, apparently there's no uniformity within our planning department regarding uh, neighborhood neighbor notifications. And they seem to differ from officer to officer and maybe area to area. But I do think that given this was such um, um, you know, a major application of this size, being in a historical uh, con conservation area and what it entails, that the, the neighbour notification uh, should have been wider. So if you could just um, maybe advise me on what, how you do how did you come to, or whoever deciding it was, on how to choose who, who was neighbour notified? And just on the the provision of uh, car parking, etc., I do know that it's in a, in a A zone, uh, and I, I recognise that. But this is the gateway to our city centre. It is just situated off uh, a major roundabout coming off the bridge and then it has all those other routes attached which I know from travelling it regularly that it's always always busy but given that there was going to be 11 occupants in, in this building or more because some of those rooms might be double um you know, the chances of emergency services having to uh, attend that building is uh, is much higher. So uh, in the terms of health and safety, was that taken into consideration whenever uh, you, you would imagine the AFA roads were, were given their determination uh, regarding car parking? So thank you. Yeah, I'm going to bring um, more in here to answer the question about proximity of informing people. Uh, she, she'll maybe uh, enlighten you on that. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Logue um, should be aware by the the current situation in terms of neighbourhood notification is very standard and it's actually ingrained now in our legislation and we're required to carry out a procedure and it's quite specific for each planning application so it wouldn't differ at all from case officer or location and it relates to um, the red line and for land and properties that above the red line um, so anything at a distance from that um, wouldn't be a requirement, um, but it's just to let you know there is a standard procedure um, which staff must follow. 
and um, and it's quite stringent. So it's just to to let let you all be aware of that. And uh, I'll maybe pass you to Malachi in regard to the traffic routes comment. And he may want to come back on that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Oak. Um, yes, um, the FA roads were consulted on the application, uh, and you know, they recognise it's within the uh, zone A, um, so there's no requirement for um, parking. Uh, they recognise that they, um, they don't, sorry, there's no there's no requirement to provide additional parking for the proposed development. Uh, I suppose in relation to uh, servicing properties, that you know the the, the current or they're, they don't give you any indication whether they consider um, you know, provision for uh, emergency services. But I suppose it's it would be as per the existing use. That you no, know, um, so um, we, we accept it's in zone A. We wouldn't require additional parking, uh, and that's that's the way we have uh, recommended. Uh, um, the approval in relation to the, the parking issue. Thank you. Any more questions, members, for the officer from Malaga? Okay, yeah, here no no one wants to speak. Um, you have a proposal. Um, Chair, John Boyle here. Sorry, John, go ahead. I'm sorry, Chair, I can't type as quick as you can talk. Uh, so <laughs> that's the way I'm coming on. Malachi, it's a Belfast accent, John. Uh, it's not even that. Um, I wouldn't want to go down that route with you now, Chair. Uh, we'd only end up falling out. But anyway, uh, all joking aside, Malachi, can we clear up the matter that I was that I raised earlier on? Uh, just to be clear, uh, Dacre Terrace is on the flat zone as as designated under the uh, the DAP. Is that correct? Yes, it's uh, within the flat zone. Um, yeah. Thank you, Maliki. Thank you, Chair. That's all I wanted to know. John, I see. Is it? We have the proposal. You want to come in, Angela? Oh, yes, Chair. Yes. Um, more, something similar to the line there of um, John uh, Maliki. The flat zone, well, flats being apartments, um, therefore HMOs have not been included um, in that area. I just want that cleared up. Um, basically, Chair, uh, was to want to accept the plans um, because they're mostly acceptable for living standards in this HMO. I can't ignore the issues of certain aspects, i.e. the kitchen and the well documented, and I agree with uh, Hillary there, well documented as antisocial behaviour in that area. Uh, so, therefore, I'm sitting on the fence and I say swaying towards abstaining from this, but I would like that cleared up that when you say flats, Malagy, a flat zone area, um, there's no HMOs in that area. Thanks. Yeah, well, it's uh, it's factually within the flat zone area, but that doesn't preclude, you know, that HMOs will be allowed in such areas. I no, so uh, I don't know if that answers the question. No, but thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Bring your proposal. Yes, thank you, Chair. Yes, I wish to propose that we do not accept the officer's recommendation to approve. I think this is a very, very important site within our city, a gateway location, um, a historic part of the city. And although we want to see housing stock brought back into use, we certainly, at least I certainly don't want to see it brought back. And this way, uh, to me, which is completely unacceptable, 10 or 11 people in a HMO, 10 or 11 uh, rooms, which could have any number of people in them. I don't think that's what we want for this area. It, that was an office development area that would be very suitable. Apartments could be very suitable. But there seems to have been a very blinkered uh, opinion taken on how this um how this property could be used, and it seems to me it's a case of cramming in as many people as possible. Um, the, the absence of 
the, the car spaces doesn't bother me so much, Chair, because I do think that anybody who would be willing to take um, a, a, a position in a, in a house like this is likely probably not even to have any uh, need for car parking uh, spaces. So I'm proposing we overturn the officer's recommendation and uh, on two grounds unacceptable living standards and also it would be very detrimental to the established character of the area considering it's next to a beautiful Georgian building and also that historic gateway into the city uh, which is some place that are tourists coming in from all areas of from the Letterkenny Road from the waterside from all different areas it's the first place they see thank you chair I'll second that chair I got that Patricia thank you for that I have a proposal on the floor for to not accept the officer's recommendation on the grounds of unacceptable living standards and uh, the detrimental effect of the area. Is that correct? Um, yes, so the, the, the character of the area. Yes, thank you. Members will go to a vote on that. I'll ask uh, more to take a vote. Sorry, chair, John, you wish to come in? I am the, the chat box there, Chair. Just to say, um, Chair, when, when, you, when we all bear in mind um, the demands that we've put on various developers, specifically um, uh, in this part of the town, um, I, I find myself agreeing with um, the proposer and the seconder on this particular occasion uh, and the reasons for refusal as well. Um, uh, they, to me, there are strong reasons for refusal. Um, and the um, the applicant may well wish, uh, in the event that this is refused, the applicant may well wish to go back to the uh, drawing board and bear in mind the comments of this committee. Thank you, John, for those wise words. Okay, can we go to a vote, please? Thank you, Mark. Okay, Chair. So this is item two only, members. Um, and the recommendation or the proposal, sorry, is not to accept officer's recommendation and to refuse the application. Alderman Alan Breslin. Or. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Just a point of clarification, Mara, this is just the first of the two uh, yes. the proposals. Sorry. That's correct. Um, it's just there, item two, yes. Item two only for this vote. Can I come in on that, Mara? Because if we if this is overturned, we won't need to vote on item three. We have to take a separate vote. Oh, okay, here. okay, right. Thank you. Thank you. Alan right. Keith Kerrigan. Uh, for Mara. Thank you. Alderman Hilary McClintock. For. Councillor Jason Barr. For. Councillor John Boyle. For. Thank you. Councillor Angela Robbins. Yeah, for more. Thank you. Councillor Paul Gallagher. I see a note in the chat box. He was out of the room, so can't vote. Um, Councillor Christopher Jackson. Christopher's left. Councillor Dan Kelly. Or more. Thank you, Dan. Councillor Patricia Logue. Or. Thank you. Kim, Councillor Kim McGuire sent his apologies. Councillor Philip McKinney. Or. Thank you, Philip. And Councillor Sean Mooney. Against. Against. Okay. Okay. So that's nine for one against and one abstention. Chair. So that vote. Thank you, Maura. So therefore, um, proposal from Alder McClintock is carried and the abstract is overturned. Right, we're now going to vote on item three, removal of the rear return and eight billings at one Darcy Terrace, Derry. Okay, Maura. Thank you. Alderman Alan Breslin. There, John Boyle here. Can I ask, can I ask a question? Go ahead, John. Relation to that. Um, uh, Maura, you might be best. As a, I mean, this is quite an unusual circumstance, and that um, normally when one 
might be approved, the other one would automatically you would go through for approval. Um, is there anything to, for us to, at this point, prevent the demolition of the rear returns? Um, uh, or might we decide that it's appropriate to, to allow for that? Bearing in mind, suppose, bearing in mind, as far that I did say the applicant oh, well wanted to go back to the drawing board, but I suppose that's up, that's up to the applicant, doesn't it? Yeah, I suppose in principle, if if the recommendation is to refuse, then we don't have a proposal to consider for demolition if it's not approved, and it has to be an agreed scheme. So are we, are we, are we saying what, what I originally said then, that we don't need to vote on this? That's kind of... We need to vote, sorry, for the record, Chair. It's a separate application. Chair, can I just again... Just we need a proposal on seconder. Chair, just... No, we need a proposal on seconder on this one, please. Chair, can I just, just again, for, as for the benefit of the committee, Chair, I mean, I, I, I don't know the answer, and I, maybe everybody else does, and I'm the only person in the room doesn't. Um, but just for the benefit of clarity, um, uh, in the event that we would, uh, we would have to, the, the recommendation at the minute is for demolition. So we would have to, we would have to, if we didn't want demolition, we would have to come up for, with a reason here now for have, not having demolition. If you know what I mean. It's the same as having a reason for overturning an officer recommendation. This is an officer recommendation. We would have to overturn it and we'd have to re have a reason for overturning it. I agree with you, John, but I'm just going to have a chat here with the, the, the team here just to see where we, we go with this. Hang on a second. Yeah, Chair, I'm just Chair, yeah. Yeah. Can, uh, can I be heard okay? Or? okay? We're going to get some legal advice here on that, John. Yeah, members. Am I coming through okay? Yes, yeah. sir. Members, um, the, this application must follow a certain course following the outcome of the previous application. Um, with the previous matter having been dealt with, with a, a recommendation to refuse, this one must be refused because there is no longer any scheme um, which would allow then for demolition to go forward. However, for the record, we do require a formal proposal, a formal seconder, and a formal vote to be taken in relation to the matter. So, as we have that accurately recorded in the minutes, but the rationale will be that it will flow automatically from the previous decision that was taken in relation to the matter. To the previous matter. Right, I'm going to propose now that we overturn the offer's recommendation to allow demolition. Chair, that's, that sounds logical enough. I, I second along with you then, Chair. Okay. Can we have a vote on that now? Or do I need to put a... Uh, a does anybody wish to come in on that? Okay, so proposal is uh, that we overturn the officer's decision to uh, permit demolition of the building at the rear, uh, seconded by Councillor Boyle. Thank you. Are any dissenting voices in that, or can we just take it as read? Okay, I see nothing in the chat box and hear nothing, so we'll take it as read. Okay, what I'm going to suggest is that we take a 15-minute break and back here 20 past four for everybody's agreement. Thank you.
Yes, Morris. I was just to see, was the church, no, was the church against that, uh, them boys different? Alderman them. President, your microphone's on. I think I'll let more how
Hey members, welcome back. Uh, the next item is LA1120210454 RM, and Katrina is going to take us through that. Thank you, Katrina. Hi, um, good afternoon. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Um, so this um, application is in front of us today um, because it's a planning officer. Um, so the site is on uh, the Corrick Beg Road in Plum Bridge, which is within the Sparren AOMB. Um, this, the site is part of a larger agricultural field, um, and this was approved um, as an infill uh, back in 2018. So this is a picture of the application site. As you can see um, in the first picture there, number 19 um, is a two-storey dwelling to the east of the site. And to the west of the site there in the second picture, you can see a pair of semi-detached dwellings. So the policy context of it is um, the Strapan Area Plan, the SPPS. Um, it's already been approved at outline. This is the reserve matters. So the principle of the site has been approved under um, CTY 8 in PPS 21. Uh, we've taken account of PPS 2, Natural Heritage, PPS 3, Access, Movement and Parking, um, PPS 15 and Building on Tradition. So the policy consideration for this application is that it's a reserve matters application and the principle of development has already been established alongside the site beside. So there was two infills approved at the time. Um, so the main policy uh, consideration for this is CTY 13 and 14. So I'll just show you the design of the dwelling. So the dwelling is uh, simple with modern elements. Um, the windows have a vertical emphasis and the chimneys are on the ridge line. The finishes of the dwelling will be smooth plaster render, black PVC windows and black roof slates. Uh, the garage is sited to the rear of the dwelling, uh, one side finished in stone and the other side finished in smooth render. The design is in accordance with building and tradition and is an appropriate design for the site and locality and is in accordance with uh, CTY 13 and 14 of PPS 21. Um, in terms of the access, you can see on the uh, drawn there on the screen, the access is to be paired with the site um, next door and visibility of 2.4 by 70 is available at the site. So in terms of um, the, uh, ac the considerations, there has been um, no objections received from any of the consultations. So in summary, um, the proposed dwelling meets the conditions of the outline approval. It's an appropriate scale and design. It will visually integrate into the surrounding countryside and not a road rural character. The proposed dwelling won't have a negative impact on the character of the Sparrens AOMB. It will not detrimentally affect residential amenity. The proposal will not prejudice road safety, materially change the flood risk, or adversely affect the designated sites or the other natural heritage interests. Um, there has been one objection received on the application. Um, uh, it was in terms of um, land ownership issues and future access to the surrounding land. Um, this is a reserve matters application. So this um, had already, this is the exact same red line as at the outline. And um, we have notified the objector that this is a civil matter um, and they have accepted our reason and we have had no further correspondence from them. So um, it's my view for us to um, accept uh, an approval on this. Thank you. Okay, members, do we have any uh, questions for the officer? Keith, Dan? Chair, uh, j just, just briefly, Chair, uh, just, just seeking clarification then that, that this application, the only reason it's before us today is the case that it is uh, an officer's application and therefore it's brought before. And if it wasn't, it would have been delegated to the, the planning authority, the planning officers, and that they would have granted approval. I, if the answer to those two questions are, are yes, uh, yeah. 
sorry, gone ahead there. Sorry, 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 Councillor. Yes, that is the case. Um, it would have been delegated only. Um, it's it, it's excluded from the delegated scheme because the applicant is a planning officer within the council. Yeah. Well, thank you, Katrina. Chair, and and that and that light, I'm I'm content to propose that we accept the officer's recommendation to approve it. Oh, we have one more speaker. Which commander, uh, Councillor Kelly? Thanks, Chair. Happy to second the uh, application um, or the, for the recommendation to uh, approve. I had a look through it. It's uh, it's fine, and yeah, as uh, the officer has, has clarified, it's only for the fact that uh, it's a council officer application that it has come to the committee, uh, and the issue is one, I suppose, of transparency, really, rather than than planning per se. So uh, I'm content to second that. Thank you, Chair. Members. Uh... Do we have any dissenting voices here on this application? I don't see anything in the chat box. I don't hear anybody speaking, so I'll take it as read that that's a unanimous decision. Thank you. Uh, Katrina, do you want to take us to the next, which is LA 11202109700F? Uh, and say it's uh, approval, Katrina. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, this application is common before the committee because it's um, a council application. Um, it's for the erection of a single storey uh, building um, at St. Columns Park um, for warden and administration and office facilities. So um, the application um, is just to let you see the location plan. Um, we You would have had an application that came before you a short while ago, um, maybe about two years ago, for the new access um, at the side of the park, um, coming down beside Everington. So the in the red line here on the aerial view, you can see where they're proposing to site this small gate lodge. Just show you some. So there's the, the, the new gates that have been implemented now and the views. And that's um, opposite the site. Any of you that know the site, that's the hairdressers building there. Um, so the proposed layout is for a very small, uh, modest kind of gate lodge, very similar for um, those councillors that would know the one in Brook Park. So it's it's like a replication of that style um, to sit the historic setting of St. Columns Park also. So the proposed floor plan layout includes uh, two warden offices, uh, welfare facilities for the wardens, including um, a bathroom, a kitchenette and changing and storage. The total size of the building is 93 square meters. Also at the rear of the building, um, there is proposed one, just show you here. Sorry, on this elevation um, to the back of this building, they're going to, there is going to be a new open and formed um, and this will go into the horticultural gardens to the rear. And that's part of the wider acorn project that's proposed. Um, so this is part of this application as well, just for access um, in terms of the elevations. Um, uh, there was just a slight amendment that HED asked for. Um, there was originally proposed to be a replication of the railings that you can see in, um, on your screen at the minute to carry on in front of the Gate Lodge building. And HED asked for that to be removed because they felt that it, it, it didn't give as much um, historic context as they wanted. And um, so that was the only amendment that we received on the application. So in terms of the policy context, um, we're taking into account the RDS 2035, the Dairy Area Plan in terms of urban design and listed buildings, um, the Strategic Plan and Policy Statement, um, PPS 6, which deals with um, listed buildings and archaeology, where there's listed buildings in this vicinity at St. Columns Park House, um, PPS 3 in terms of roads, and PPS 8, because this is a park and it would be we would have to consider it under loss of open space as well for the erection of this small building. So uh, in terms of the consultee response, as I um, mentioned earlier, uh, uh, HED had asked for a revision to remove the railings. So that was done and they were content. HED monuments have no concerns with any of the uh, works being carried out. Um, roads acknowledge um, that the site is maintained by the council and they are happy just with conditions and that's sufficient parking and turning um, is available. 
So the summary of issue is that the site is within the St. Columns Park. This is a much needed facility um, basically a, a, to show people that there is a presence on the site as, as well as anything else and to provide much needed facilities for the park wardens. So um, that's the proposal in front of us today. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Medici, you wish to come in there? Yes, Chair, thank you very much for letting me in and thank you for the officer for taking us through the presentation. And uh, Chair, uh, I know this area well. In fact, I'm going there to see them. They, they trained in there, uh, but uh, uh, it's, it's a welcome addition to the park. The park is a large, large area and uh, it will be a welcome addition for the staff who use that park and probably for the wider uh, waterside area. Um, I see that uh, the statutory council tees um, have no problems with the application and um, from what I can hear from the officer then the design and build will be um, tasteful and will be um, complementary to the park itself. So in light of that Chair, I, I welcome the application. Um, it's the precursor to the ACORN project that's coming and I would have no um, hesitation in uh, proposing the application Chair. Thank you. Thank you for a proposal. Uh, Alderman McClintock, you wish to come in? Yes, Chair, thank you. And I'm happy to second um, the proposal before us. My question was going to be uh, to Katrina um, as a similar to Brick Park. So she answered that already, which I'm more than content with. I think it's important that there is a presence there. And I think it's very well cited and very well designed and will integrate very much into that area. So happy to second the proposal. Thank you. Okay, members, we have a proposal in front of us here uh, from Councillor Mooney, signed by Oliver McClintock, to accept the officer's recommendation. Have we any dissenting voices? No, I don't see anything in the chat box. Do I hear anybody coming in? So we'll take that as read. Thank you, officers. Or, sorry, thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you, officer, and thank you. Move on to item eight consultation from a DFI on review of strategic planning policy on renewable and low carbon energy. And Pontius is going to take us through that. Thank you. Good afternoon, members, and thank you, Chair. Um, item eight is, um, as members recall, this is a public consultation from DFI uh, on its uh, review of the SPPS. Um, strategic planning policy on renewable energy and low carbon development. Um, it's a public consultation, but the head of planning uh, received a consultation letter um, just before Christmas. Um, and responses are to be submitted by the uh, 11th of February by next week. Uh, members will recall that an initial paper was brought to um, uh, the planning committee in January to uh, alert members about this consultation and to give any members the opportunity to uh, to uh, make an early input to the uh, to the uh, to our council response. So um, a few comments were received from members on the day, uh, but no subsequent submissions uh, were actually received. Um, so council planning officers, uh, both from development management and from the local development plan team, have uh, considered and prepared a draft response and we've worked in conjunction with the council's energy officer and also uh, the council's climate officer. So members, uh, we've uh, attached to appendix uh, seven, the, uh, the consultation issues paper and it sets out uh, Nine broad uh, topics and questions uh, of which uh, DFA are looking for uh, for comment. Um, and there's there's approximately eleven, I think, uh, questions asked. But there's also the final one is for other issues, and that gives us the opportunity to put in any other any other matters which uh, didn't quite fit into the questions they had asked. Um, in terms of background, members will be familiar with the existing strategic planning policy, which is set out in the SPPS, and we've included the link to those pages, uh, as well as uh, PPS 18, 
and their supplementary planning guidance and it particularly on um, on um, wind energy um over the past probably 10 15 years there's been an awful lot of um of renewable projects and particularly wind um there is there has been a um, northern ireland target uh, to produce 40 percent of our electricity uh, through uh, renewable energy sources uh, at the minute that's up just below 50 percent it's about 46 47 percent has been achieved but um and that was primarily through you know the northern ireland renewable energy um the nairo obligation and rocks etc but that um came to a halt i think about 2016 17 and we have, we have had a lot less applications since then but uh, there are there's quite a few um, installations in this district, particularly of uh, wind farms and wind turbines. Um, as I've said out there, members, the uh, just to uh, remind you that uh, just before Christmas, uh, the uh, Northern Ireland government brought uh, out the um, Northern Ireland Energy Strategy, and that has confirmed, um, as was sort of well flagged, that the new target. Uh, for um, renewable energy uh, to electricity is, set, is now going to be 70%. So we're looking for 70% by 2030 of all our uh, energy supply coming from renewable sources. This is very much in, in line with um, wider climate change legislation, which is currently um, on its way uh, through the, um, uh, the Northern Ireland Assembly. But uh, it's... I think members, everybody's aware that we're heading towards a uh, 70% target for renewables and also we're heading towards uh, net zero by either 2040, 2045, 50. That. So it's all part of that pro process and the, re the uh, Department for Infrastructure's review of SPPS uh, on renewables is very timely and uh, it, it is important. And, um, so, members, as I've said out there in um, at Appendix 8, uh, we have prepared a draft response uh, for submission for next week. As I said, there are uh, about 10 questions and we have uh, presented um, some 22 different points, uh, which we as officers believe is the appropriate uh, set of comments to include and particularly from uh, a planning point of view we've, we've tried to you know include uh, very much what the comments and the issues we've had with the current SPPS and very much to reflect the comments from members that we've had uh, over the past number of years um, both at planning committee to do with planning applications and also in preparing the local development plan so members, uh, I don't propose to go through every one of them individually, but I'm happy to take any comments or questions on any of the any of the 22 points that we have uh, included in the proposed um, the proposed response. Just on one point, I would add that in point two one, we have suggested that you know, we, we've highlighted that our spatial strategy in the LDP will particularly um, um, focus on the special countryside areas and the alleys but we'd also just that would include the aonbs as well in that so uh other than that chair uh, i'm really happy to take any questions or to expand upon any of the specific points and hopefully uh chair if members have anything else to add or they want us to change anything um we'll be happy to do that uh, as i said in our response to win by next uh, by the 11th thank you chair Thank you very much, Matt Pontius. And uh, have we any questions from the floor uh, or any comments? Uh, I see John Boiler. Come in there. Chair, do, do you want me to come in instead? Yes, yeah, sure. Go ahead, please, Dan. Uh, thanks. Uh, just um, 
Uh, sorry, if, if John's waiting, I, I'll jump in uh, with a couple of comments. Uh, I welcome the response, Chair, and it's great to have a draft uh, response. Um, it, it's, it's good in part, uh, and other parts, I feel, uh, uh, probably no surprise to everybody that there, there, there's, um, I feel it's weaker in other places. Um, I think, um, I, I don't want to hold back the meeting, so I'm, I'm content to maybe f submit um, if there's a date or a time, whether Friday afternoon or something, maybe by three o'clock, we, we have submissions back. I don't know if that will give officers enough time to kind of review what we're going to submit. Um, but I, I just think, I think we need to be a little bit more forceful um, in terms of like what we as a council have achieved over the past period of time uh, with the, uh, the policy framework that was there, the, 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 the spatial and, and strategic uh, framework. We as a council are ahead of the curve uh, in terms of delivery. Some councils haven't moved and that has picked up, but I do think what we have achieved as a council should be um, more forcefully represented in our opening uh, comments. Uh, I have a little bit of an issue with um, a 2.1. Uh, I appreciate uh, Ron just made reference to the fact that AOMBs will be included in our response, but I do also have a wee bit of an issue with the last sentence in that paragraph, which um, uh, still is promoting this line of uh, there should be a presumption in favour. Uh, and I do think we need to be moving away from that kind of language within the planning system because it gives the perception, whether rightly or wrongly, in the public domain um, that you know there, there's, um, there are certain applications coming before um, councils or before the department that are looked on more favourably in areas where uh, it's nigh on impossible, for example, to get a house approved, but you can get uh, a turbine, a 180 metre turbine, you know, approved and that, um, something that uh, gives a little bit of concern. I think we we do need to move away from that kind of language. And I, I do think we've moved away from that in our LDP. Uh, and I appreciate that's a district wide document, but I, I don't see why within the context of uh, the strategic policy for the whole of the North, uh, that we should be promoting that language or seem to be promoting that language. And I. I, I don't. I think all applications should meet all of the policies, and if they if they do, uh, then they can be approved. Uh, but I don't think we should be going in with this. You know, somebody should be submitting an application and the knowledge that it's going to be nigh on impossible for the planning authority to say no, uh, and that's not a good uh, a good place for us to be in. I think I mentioned before in relation to planning um, policy documents, uh, there's a, a significant. Uh, I suppose blind spot in relation to peatland, and I note um, the the strategic uh, plan and policy statement again. It talks about active peatland, and that's that's very problematic, as we saw in the Bar Craig application, uh, where there was a whole argument around what was active and what was uh, not active peatland, and in the end, that application was approved at appeal, uh, because um, there was no consideration in policy for peatland and the associated carbon storage. Uh, of peatland that wasn't considered to be active. In my opinion, and indeed in most modern scientific analysis now, all peatland is considered active insofar as it, it, it operates as a carbon store. Uh, so it actively uh, is working uh, to mitigate the impact of, of climate change. But there was no consideration, absolutely none, in any plan and policy document for um, uh, peatland that doesn't have this specific type of sphagnum moss uh, growing on it, so it's 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 just considered worthless. Uh, so now that the the uh, you know that application has gone through, we've seen the destruction of of the peatlands up at the Bar Craig, and also just with reference to Bar Craig, that application had a significant amount of support from the community because over a period of a number of uh, community consultations, the company uh, who promoted that application uh, promised a community benefit fund. And um, when all was said and done and the application was over the line, the company walked away from that community benefit fund uh, and, the, and the community were very angry uh, that they had been you know, played uh, so poorly. Uh, so I do think we need to look at that issue. I know we have it in there in terms of looking at you know, developer contributions rather than the voluntary community contributions. It's in there in our opening comments. Um, but I do think we need to have a, this does need to be taken. Somebody needs to take this in hand because um, communities are being played by these large companies who just know that the impact of a small community is going to have no reputational impact if they come out to complain 
about a company walking away from a community benefit fund if they say they're going to wrap it up even before it gets going. They can absorb that um, reputational impact because it is just nigh on, uh, it's, it's so minimal. You know, if you've got a couple of hundred people at most in a rural community complaining about a company who's saying, well, you promised us this, and you've walked away, they can absorb that because uh, it might get a headline in a local newspaper or it might get a headline on, on a Facebook uh, posting, but it's not, it's not going to have any impact on that community's uh, turnover or, you know, and, and, and the returns for stakeholders. So I do think we need to have um, a more robust re a reference to these community benefit funds and the role that uh, they are being used at the minute, as we saw in the Bar Craig application in our own district, uh, that uh, they, to buy off a community with absolutely nothing at the end of it. So that's that's something that needs to be addressed, um, and I welcome that. Um, also, I, I think the, the issue around other councils uh, not pulling their weight, I mean, those are other councils where they have a significant uh, grid network and infrastructure. Our council doesn't have that. Uh, and we saw, for example, with their own application uh, to the, um, the grid to connect up our, our um, uh, solar panels at Castle Derg, we were told there's no capacity on the grid, so we had to remove some of those solar panels in order in, on other to other centres in order to get a connection. That's not good enough, you know. So there's other there's other council districts that have significant opportunity to connect to the to the network. They have the significant population centres and industry centres that we don't have. Uh, so they should be pulling their weight in terms of uh, promoting uh, and pushing um, uh, generation. Uh, and, and then they, and they just need to be pulling their weight overall. And I think that needs to be, it is there, and I'm glad to see it in our response. Um, there was one other thing, but it's, it's gone. Oh, yes, uh, the amenity impact. Um, as, as the turbines have got increasingly larger, and we're seeing applications now for turbines of 180 metres in height, those are significant structures in the landscape. And I do note um, there's, this is something I think is, is a little bit weak in our response. Uh, and we've accepted uh, 6.224, I think it is, um, development that generates energy from renewable sources will be permitted where they will not have an unacceptable adverse impact. But the whole of that section on renewable energy in the strategic plan and statement is negated in terms of the visual impact if you take a 6.230, because that one paragraph negates all the other rambling references to uh, visual impact uh, because it says it will not necessarily be the case that the extent of visual impact or visibility of wind farm development will give rise to negative effects. So that one paragraph negates everything else that's good in that uh, whole section on renewable energy. And it, it's, you can't argue against that. So I do think the, the department have to look again at 6.230 because that undermines the whole of that, of the whole other uh, references to visual impact uh, in, that, um, in that section. Uh, and it really does undermine it, especially now with the scale and size of turbines. You know, 180 metres is massive uh, and it's possibly not going to be the tallest uh, or the end of the, the height increases that we're seeing. We are looking at, 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 at even more supersized uh, turbines, uh, uh, as far as I can see from some press references. So uh, it is a little bit concerning. And I think, uh, you know, that visual impact, the amenity impact of having these turbines at, at um, you know, a minimum of 500 metres. 500 metres is nothing when you're talking about a structure that's 180 metres high. And I do think that there's, there's aspects of that that do need to be looked at again. Uh, I will um, commit to, to putting some of these points down um, and, and submitting them to the department before um, lunchtime on Friday, if that's helpful for, for officers, Chair. Um, and maybe if they want to look at, you know, at sort of wording it up or seeing what can be adopted and then circulating it around for us before sending it into the department. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Don, for those comments. Uh, Pontius, do you want to uh, speak on those comments that Don has made there? Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor. Um, yeah, I suppose, partially a vote of confidence could do better, I suppose, as well. Uh, hopefully, um, no, we're very happy to take to take comments, um, if if the committee are happy that 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 the that the the input and the opinions of of the member are as uh, reflective of what the planning committee want to put forward, yeah, that's certainly no problem. If it's by by Friday, uh, we'll be happy to try and incorporate it. Um, if members agree that 
Um, just to, on the specifics, well, hopefully we um, we have tried to be reasonably forceful on what we've achieved, but it's probably the format of um, the consultation and the, the, there's like a template of questions that probably doesn't give us much opportunity to uh, include about you know our own level of of um, of uh, achievements and uh, output to date. But certainly we can try and fit it in. Yeah, but we'll put it in anyway, even though it doesn't uh, quite fit into the the uh, consultation template. Um, moving the the presumption in favour is probably something which is in the existing. Um, it's in the existing SPPS because the government, not surprisingly, uh, as part of the wider, uh, you know, the government effort, the program for effort for government, and move towards sustainable development, and uh, to combat climate change, uh, probably does feel that it needs to be positive, and that other than in um, certain spatially identified areas that there shouldn't be a, a ban on um, on the turbines really widespread across Northern Ireland or our district or any part of it. But certainly, you know, um, that's probably why those comments are in the existing uh, SPPS, that, you know, that there is a presumption in favour uh, of areas which aren't identified as being um, specifically very sensitive. But uh, in our comments, we certainly have qualified a presumption in favour, but subject to normal planning and environmental considerations. But certainly, um, if, mem if the, the member wants to uh, um, add or tweak to that, it'll be very welcome. Uh, in terms of peatland, yes, hopefully we have identified the issues that you have that you have raised in point nine C four that we would hope to have uh, that policy extend to all peatland, not just. The um, the active peatland, and I think that is something that we have reflected in our LDP already. Um, community benefits funds, yes, we have proposed in one point four there to uh, significantly upgrade that aspect, but uh, so that it is a developer contribution, not just a sort of like a um, a community contribution, um, just like a sort of after the effect, so that it can be seriously taken into account um, uh, as part of the decision making process and uh, stood over rather than a voluntary community contribution at the minute. Um, so certainly we, we can word that stronger if the committee feels that. Um, and the amenity impact, uh, again, it's probably going back uh, the para one um, or six two thirty is again part of the the government's wider initiative to uh, be positive on renewable energy and uh, but if the council uh, would like to give a stronger um, counter uh, input on that that's something we, yeah we can we can put in so um overall yeah I'm we're happy to take uh, any comments if that's what the committee decide thank you thank you for that punch of here uh, members um Maura, we'd like to come in and speak on this year. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to follow up there um, on some of the comments that are made by um, Councillor Kelly, and that I do think that, um, you know, although we are in some ways restricted with some of the questions, the first question I think is, is quite wide and strategic. And I think if there are matters that we do um, want to raise, for instance, um, some of the aspects about our position and our achievements thus far and the scale of renewable energy that this council has already um, created, that that actually um, could sit within that general area or a covering letter as well. And we can strengthen that through a covering letter, so there's no problem with that. And I don't think we have any issue either with the timelines and the idea of going back out and sharing it with rest of the members to give us time then to consume that and get it away by the 11th of February. That's great. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Bob Mora. Um, just out to members, um, are we all in agreement of Dan's?
I don't hear. I understand the points. We all agree on um, Dan's proposals. Okay, I take it as read. Thank you for that, uh, Dan. Thank you. Okay, items nine and ten, uh, which is the transboundary consultation uh, with regards to DFA regarding the proposed riverine community. Uh, Andre is going to take both of these. Okay, Andre. Yes, thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, members. Um, the purpose of this paper is to advise members that we have received um, a consultation from DFA. Um, so it's a transboundary consultation um, in relation to an application which has been received um, from Ambor Planala, um, and it is to do with the Riverine project. So there's two separate consultations um, have been sent for two separate applications, and they're in the two papers, item nine and item 10. So item nine paper, um, this consultation is in relation to the development of the park on the Lefford side. Um, so that includes indoor and outdoor recreational facilities, um, meeting and event space and additional landscaping. Um, so officers, the application was accompanied by an environmental statement um, and uh, members will also be aware or may be aware that we um, Donegal County Council and Darien Strabane District Council um, have engaged um, with the Riverine Park. So there'll be proposals also for the Lufford side or sorry, the Strabane side of the, the park also. Um, but this consultation will be responded to, to DFA and then they will pass the comments on to Ambor Planella. Um, so officers are happy to take any comments that members wish to make. Um, and we'll return a consultation response to DFI. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, Andre. Uh, are there any questions for Andre on the project, the Riverine project? Uh, Chair, is Dan here? Can I come in? Dan, yeah. Uh, a, a slightly sort of technical uh, question for, for uh, Andre, and it's in relation to uh, is there a, an application, a planning application, live planning application for the same uh, uh, site, I suppose, um, uh, for Derry City and Straban District Council um, for the Straban side of this project? And how does that, if there is, how does that impact on us uh, making a comment on the same application, which is on the Donegal side of the, uh, if you know what I mean, it's the same application straddling the two jurisdictions, but if there's a live app, a part of this site is under a live application in our district. Does that, um, because that would have to come to council committee as a, a council application, does that preclude us from making uh, as a committee a uh, comment on, on uh, the, the, uh, the part of the application which is on the Donegal side? Um, Chair, if that makes any sense at all. Um, through the Chair. Um... Yes, we're aware that the Riverine project is a project that straddles both um, the Lufford side and the Straban side. Um, we haven't yet received, officers haven't yet received a formal application for the Straban um, element of the park. Um, and I suppose this consultation is simply any comments that um, Council wish to make on the, the Lufford side of the proposals. Um, as it will be Ambor Planella who are processing and issuing the decision on that element of the proposal. Um, I think it's it's okay to say that you know members are aware that this is part of a wider project that also includes land um, in our council area. Um, but it, it doesn't preclude that we can't make a response specifically on the those elements of the project that are located in the the south at the moment. Thank you for that, that answers your question. Yeah, it does answer the question. Thanks, Chair. And mm -hmm. that, that being the case, then I would be proposing that we would respond to the consultation um, and ha haven't had a, a chance to look in depth at the environmental impact assessment, but from what I can see, it, it all looks um, above board. So I'd be kind of uh, thinking that we should be responding favorably to the, the consultation process. Thank you for that, uh, Dan. And Paul, you wish to come in? Yes, Chair. Thank you for letting us in. Uh, but like Dan, but 
it probably means a wee bit more clear, but uh, and I know we're talking about the Donegal side, so conflict of interest. I'm, I'm not sure. I've got a conflict of interest on the Straban side, <laughs> uh, but I, t- I tend to think this is it's, it's, this is one project, maybe, uh, and 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 the deep depth of law, the two t- jurisdictions, but this is one project. I uh, and I've lobbied for this project for a long time, so I, I would be declaring an interest. I uh, if I have to declare an interest, I will on, on the northern side. If that precludes me from declaring one, declaring one on the free state side, I am happy to say that I think we should be <laughs> engaging with it in a positive manner. <laughs> so I don't know if I'm scared it around that or not, but when it comes to the application coming on to this council for a decision, I, I'll be declaring an interest. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, just to suppose through the Chair, I. I can confirm, you know, there is an environmental statement that has been submitted for the two applications that are being dealt with by Ambor Planella. Um, and yes, the consultants have done the right thing and have treated the environmental statement as a whole project. So it does take into <clears throat> account the land on this Dairy City and Straban um, council side also. Um, I don't know whether and legally and declaration of interest. Um, I don't know if Philip wants to advise any further on that, but the environmental statement um, does take into account the whole project. So I, I get your point, Councillor Gallagher. Thanks for that, Paul. Yeah, I don't think Philip wants to come in. No, <laughs> no he doesn't. Right. Uh, so we will respond. We will be responding to that. So, yeah. So thank thank you for that, Dan, as well. Okay, um, is there any other questions or inquiries for Andre, or can we move on? Try some wish to come in there. Okay, going to move on to item 11, NI Planning Conference 2022. And uh, Eamon, I think, is going to speak on that. Thank you, Chair. To you, Ken, members, this is a surprise members. Chair, I can't hear one word. Okay, we're just trying to sort the technical problem out here. Uh, Angela, just bear with me a second. Sorry, can members hear me now? Yeah, is that okay? Thank you, uh, again, members, apologies. Um, again, this is to advise members that the Northern Ireland Planning Conference is going to take place in Belfast on the 2nd of March. And this is to seek members' uh, approval for three members of the planning committee if they so wish to attend. Um, that would be the chair plus two other members. Um, uh, all the details are contained within your pack members. And again, it's uh, there for yourselves to, to make the decision as to which members wish to attend. Um, if members agree, they can inform us of who wishes to attend and we make the appropriate arrangements. Thank you, Chair. Go ahead, Dar. I just saying, Chair, there's a very obvious clash in the date. Yes, I know. Yes, we were discussing that earlier, John. Yes, um, we're yeah. aware that that is a date of a planning meeting. Yeah, um, I, I've attended it before, Chair, and I'd be happy enough if somebody else wants to go. And I feel it, and I would much prefer to be online for the. Or, and I think I'll be in person actually in the or wherever it happens to be after the planning committee. So I, I've attended it before. It is worth while, but I'll pass up the opportunity. I just thought it'd be worth pointing out that as the day of the planning committee. All right, John, that was a question I was actually going to ask you if you thought it was beneficial, but you've really answered that. So thank you for that. Uh, Keith, would you like to come in? Uh, sorry, Chair. No, I was just going to just going to touch on the same topic that John had raised, you know, that it's clashing with uh 
with with our committee meeting and therefore you're potentially picking three out of the 14 away and I know we're kind of are we we're, have we only 11 as it stands today out of the 14 and if you potentially took another three you're maybe just leaving yourself up here if you even have that quorum so uh, just that's just unfortunate that clashes way our, our committee meeting uh, that's a very valid point actually um, I think what we'll do is we'll maybe have a discussion about it and then come back see if it's Chair, if I come in. Yes, go ahead, Paul. Yeah. Uh, Chair, and I see like you, you indicated an interest in going, so maybe the chair could represent us all. Fair point, Paul. Yeah, fair point. Right. Okay. Councillor Gallagher. Yes. Paul, do you want to make a proposal? Yeah, happy, happy, Chair. The uh, the uh, make a proposal that the chair represents the planning committee. I'll second that, Chair. Second, if you're happy chair. with that. Okay, well, taking an agreement then that uh, the proposal is that I, the chair, represents the uh, planning committee from Derry City and Strabane District Council. Thank you very much for that. Cheers. Chair, can I come in on that? Yes, Dan, sorry, I didn't see you in the chat box. You're right. Um, um, yeah, I'm content with that proposal that you would represent the committee. I'm just wondering, would, would it be possible for uh, officers to explore? Uh, I know other conferences, um, we will have another option around um, that electronically, all of the papers and stuff would be available, um, you know, that they could access um, uh, in the aftermath of any conference. And I'm just wondering, if that could be also be explored so that you know it wouldn't be just uh, depending on you bringing back a, an oral uh, update from the um, from the conference itself but that the papers and um, potentially even some of the uh, presentations through videos would be available to all members to access very valid point um Dan, as was pointed out to me earlier um, the likes of john boyle doesn't understand my accent anyway so i'll just pass it across to him That's very good, Chair. Um, and yeah, we certainly explore that, members, and um, um, keep members informed. Thank you. Okay, members, can we move on, please? Uh, open for information, planning appeals update, and Maura's going to take us through that. Thank you, Chair members. This is for information only, and we have our standard um, template with all the update on on that from the appeals paper. But just to highlight, we've got two new appeals that have been submitted since the last committee, and that is um, two enforcement cases, well, it's both related in regard to an end of terrace um, development um, at West End Terrace in Berry. Um, so you can see there that that has been highlighted. We don't know when the dates are for that, but that's come through now and we will deal with that depending on what nature or what way um, the PAC will want us to take it. And also members just to notify you that there has been um, an appeal result updated on the P from the PAC and the application that's subject to appeal in Ross Bay um, we've just been notified that that um, particular appeal has been allowed um, last week, and I just wanted members to be aware of that. Um, and other than that, really, Chair, sure, that's all I wanted to highlight in regards to that paper. Thank you. So that, Maura, is there anything that the members wish to ask Maura on that issue? Chair, can I come on there, please, Maura? You said can. West End Terrace. Is that West End Park we're talking about? Um, no, actually, it's West End Terrace. Um, it's probably, it's not exactly in that location. It's the opposite side. Um, and then, hold on a minute, maybe there's a, diff, a problem with the address there. All right, the second one is West End Park. Um, so I'll give you the the locations, um, Councillor Logue. It's wet. The first 
um, an unauthorized excavation of land being engineered in operations that relates to land to the rear of one West End Terrace. And the second, which is LA 11 2018 0693F, which you maybe are referring to as a new three story end of terrace dwelling house at lands adjacent to 22 West End Park, which you'll remember was subject to discussion and decision at the at the committee not so long ago. So both of those cases have been um, have been appealed. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes, I say, Angela, do you wish to come in or is it John before you? I actually, I actually think Dan was in front of me. Sorry, Chair, but I just want to know more. I didn't catch the, the end of your um, re report there. Which appeal was allowed just as a matter of interest to us? Yeah, the application um, in regards to Ross Bay, the subject of PDH and a decision um, has actually been decided and the PAC have allowed that appeal. And Thank therefore, you, Lauren. they've recommended approval and the application will be approved. Uh, Don, you wish to come in now? Yeah, Chair, thank you. It's just, I was wondering, was there any applications for costs here since last month? And if so, like, was there any value attached to those? Um, not that I'm aware of, but to be fair, I haven't been in the de over the detail and Suzanne's not here today. And Andre, I don't think there's any in Andre's cases, but not that I'm aware of, um, Councillor Kelly. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. John. John. Thanks, Chair. It was in relation to cost as well, but more in relation to Ross Bay. Uh, albeit more as indicating that we've only just received that information. Yeah. John, yeah. No, there was no cost claim in advance of that appeal, so um we wouldn't be expecting anything at this stage now. Uh, more thank you. All right, thanks. Yeah, uh, we have to... Sorry, Chair, there's another paper below that. Okay, we also have another paper I'm going to speak about, which is DFI referral direction on LA 11201801860. Thanks, Chair. Members, this is simply a notification from DFI that the Article 17 that they've placed on the planning application, um, a LA 11 2018 -0186, and that was the multi-storey indoor outdoor facility at um, at Lands, um, and as better as we've known, the Straban Athletic case um, at north of Holy Cross College in South Bardenley Park in Straban. Um, well, they have obviously made a decision on that um, some months later, but we have been notified now that the department has called that application in. So the minister will make that decision and lies outside our jurisdiction now. So we had that notification on the 5th of January um, and just wanted to update members on that. Thank you, Chair. Okay, members, um, we're going to go into confidential. Chair, before you do, can I just comment on that? Certainly, Dan, yeah. Yeah, I, there's nothing in the paper, Maura, to indicate um, or Angus has not indicated why it has taken them so long to come to a determination. I mean, it's not that they have determined the case in the past year that it's been with them in their office. They've just come to a conclusion that yes, they're going to call it in. And now the process of effectively um, determining this application sort of starts again from dot. Um, and it's very concerning. And I'm just, I suppose I'm, I'm, I've got one eye on the, the audit office report and I'm just kind of looking at these major applications that are sitting, um, that, that are taking months to get called into the department. 
And what impact are these having on our, our time frames at, at Council and our, our responses? Because one of the major criticisms of the Audit Office report is the, 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 the length of time it's taken these. And I'm just wondering, have they considered in their audit, you know, that this, there, there are a lot of things that are outside of our control. Uh, and we had those, um, those Article 17 notices that went on for months and months as well, you know, and that, that, that uh, impacted on our time frame. So I'm just, I'm just, there's nothing in the, there's nothing in the paper to say, I'm sorry, it has taken so long, or there's, there's nothing by way of sort of like explanation. And it's, it's really disappointing that it's taken them 10 over 10 months to get to the point where the, you know, that they're now just deciding to call it in. And I find that just really unacceptable because the council is called out uh, on these things routinely, but the department seems to get away in the, in the smoke. To the chair, um, Councillor Kelly, I think we've you've raised this and we've discussed this before planning committee. Whenever we had on numerous occasions written to the chief planner um, in regards to several Article 17 cases, um, including, if I recall, Little and Evie Schroed and Strabane Athletic. And interestingly, um, the heads of planning collectively um, have been raising concerns because they have been taken some some months for theirs to be returned and we were discussing it recently and I was obviously informing them of the length of time it was taken ours. So we're not on our own in regards to that, Councillor Kelly, and the problem that we've had, as you can recall, when we were writing to the department about it, there's nothing in the legislation that requires them through a timeline in order to respond, which was something that was always concerning ourselves. And if I am not mistaken, we added this in as a recommendation as part of the review of legislation. And uh, alongside that, we also raised the concerns about the statistics and the timelines. And um, because clearly we were of concerns that it was holding back. Now, if in my understanding, and I will clarify this uh, and, and advise you on this, but it's my understanding, the difficulty we also shared was that if they take a year to consider whether they're calling it in or not, and then don't call it in, and then the applications return to us, then that delay of a year goes on our figures, obviously, and not in theirs if we issue the decision. However, if the application is called in by the department, I am assuming that they will issue the decision and therefore the delay will rest with them. But I do want that clarified for myself um, because we obviously have a few now too um, that I have been called in and subsequently I want to be um, aware and can let the team know and, and John and, and various officers know that that has maybe having an impact on our figures. But yes, you're quite right to raise it. And clearly when I look at the review, I will be looking at some of those considerations, Councillor Kelly, to see if they have been taken on board. Um, I'll be interested to check that out as well, because it was raised as, as collective as heads of planning, and I think it was definitely raised um, first from ourselves. So, yeah, that's really all I have to say, Chair, if that's okay. Thanks. Thank you for that, Maura. Uh, Patricia, have you a question now, or is yours for confidential? No, no, it's for not you. Uh, uh, yeah. No, it is, uh, thanks, Maura, for that. And uh, I think Dan's question uh, was very relevant. Um, it seems to be a case of don't do as I do, but do as I say. And, you know, that is certainly not acceptable, especially uh, uh, given uh, the the report. But uh, it has something that needs clarified. You know, I don't think it's good enough to think that it will, you know, it will go down in their figures. But um, it's certainly up to the time it's called in will probably be the uh, go down in our figures, which is nearly a year, 10 months. So I do think as well as, uh, you know, we have got this notification now that we should write back and tell them that, you know, this matter ha has been with them for 10 months. And given the review, uh, sorry, the report uh, that, that has come out, you know, it is, it is uh, all not looking good for, uh, the, the planning department overall, and if they're saying we have to keep day to uh, certain time scales, then I'm afraid they need to uh, be doing the same. 
the gist to you, I would just like to say this must be very, very disappointing for uh, the the Straban community because um, this this decision was made on a Straban area plan, which is 21 years out of date. And uh, on top of that, there's probably a lot of cocktail of funding, et cetera, et cetera, which, is, which could probably will be lost now um, uh, to that community and probably a much needed facility. So I think all that needs to be put in the letter too. So I'm suggesting and proposing that we write a letter uh, with those points on it, please. Thank you. Well, Patricia, I'm so, uh, yeah, I would second that actually. Can we uh, uh, write back to these things and uh, express our displeasure at their, their letter? Um, are we all in agreement with that? Okay, we'll take it red. Yes, more. Yeah. Yep. Can we go into confidential, please? So proposed, Chair. Down the chair. 